All right, um, I guess we'll get started, unless anybody really needs to take a break. You might need a break before listening to me, though. Uh, so in case nobody recognizes me in the tie, it is me. Um, the tie will be coming off immediately after the talk. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, acute ischemic stroke. Um, mo this is uh, primary. This is kind of timely because they just released a new uh, set of guidelines that had a lot of updates in it um, that came out uh, October 2019. Uh, so that was good timing for this talk. Uh, I don't have any disclosures. Nobody pays me any money for anything. Um, what we're going to talk about is evidence-based uh, treatment of stroke, and like I said, this is all going to be, you know, based on the most recent guidelines. Um, and you know, we want to recognize these important treatment opportunities uh, because time is, you know, really critical in in stroke. And then the other thing we'll talk about more towards the end is the quality metrics that we uh, that we need to meet as part of like the core measures. And, uh, and as part of our quality for the Comprehensive Stroke Center. Um, those are not too much changed, but we're gonna go over those all in detail at the, at the very end, particularly important for the hospitalists like, like you, Nigel. <laughs> all right, so we're, um, we're applying to be a Comprehensive Stroke Center through DMV. Um, currently, right now, we're a Joint Commission Primary Stroke Center. And, uh, but the hospital has chosen to go with DMV for uh, the comprehensive uh, stroke center part. Uh, one of the requirements that's uh, particularly important is that any physician admitting uh, a stroke patient has to have those eight hours of CME. So congratulations, you're gonna get that today all in one shot. Um, and that, that's an annual requirement. So that's any hospitalist uh, or you know, admit, any admitting doctor. Uh, and if you don't have those stroke hours, you're not gonna be able to admit patients, basically. So we designed this symposium to get you those hours, to make it as easy as possible. Um, so I'm gonna cover a fair amount of material and then hopefully we'll still get, get out of here early. Um, so I, I broke it down into a couple sections. Um, I mainly tried to, to do this in, in a, sort of a chronologic order to kind of make it make some sense. So uh, this is, you know, as if you are, you know, treating the patient. So we'll, first step is, you know, identifying that they're actually having a stroke. Then we'll talk about acute interventions. Uh, and then the diagnostic evaluation and the initial treatment plan. Then dealing with the complications. Uh, and then the last is the core measures and quality metrics, which are part of discharge. And so, so it's kind of structured chronologically how you would deal with the patient during, uh, during an admission. So stroke's pretty common, uh, judging from especially the number of stroke alerts we have here. Uh, it's still, you know, third leading cause of, of death or maybe fourth, depending on who you ask. Um, it is the number one cause of permanent disability. Uh, and, you know, it's estimated that it costs over $50 billion a year worth of, worth of care. Uh, so this is a big deal. Um, the reason why you all should at least have some interest in this is that, is that strokes don't happen in neurologist's office. They, they happen in the hospital, they happen at home, and whether you're a neurologist or not, you know, you're going to end up uh, coming across these patients and treating them. If you're a hospitalist, you're going to be, you know, admitting these people, uh, and so uh, you're definitely going to have uh, a lot of exposure to these patients. Um, despite how common this is, it, it's almost like an orphan disease. Um, so these are 2006 numbers, so they they may not be totally accurate, but they're probably not substantially changed. So the number of physicians is estimated somewhere about 600,000 uh, people. And of that, you know, neurologists make up about 2% of the total physician population. And the number of people that sort of specialize in the treatment of stroke is uh, less than one-tenth of 1% 1 of physicians. Uh, so despite how common this is, there are very few people that really 
sort of, you know, actually specialize in treating this. And, you know, it's not to say that other neurologists, you know, can't do it. It's just, it, it's sort of weird, you know, how this sort of worked out, you know, the numbers wise. So, so we have, you know, and especially because, you know, of the fact that there's really not, not very many of us around, uh, is that this really is very much a, uh, uh, you know, a, a team sport. So, you know, I can't do this alone. I can't even do it like with, you know, a couple other people. It takes like a whole big team uh, worth of people to help manage these, these patients. Uh, and specifically, you know, I, the, you know, the first, you know, most of the time with these patients, you know, the first point of contact is gonna be the, the emergency department. So the ED physician, you know, their role and primary responsibility is going to be uh, identifying these patients that present with stroke um, and, you know, initi you know, initiating a process to start uh, managing those patients. And most of the time that's going to be calling a stroke alert. Um, but, the, you know, the big thing for them is, you know, is identifying those patients right at the onset because, you know, that's the time when we're going to potentially be able to do these acute interventions. And, you know, if the patient sits in the ER for four hours before anybody notices, well, you know, our, our window of opportunity is, is gone. Uh, the neurologist that's involved, you know, their job really is a couple of things. You know, one, they should be providing the diagnosis. So, you know, the fact that it is a stroke or isn't a stroke. Um, they should be managing the acute interventions and, and providing, you know, a treatment plan. Uh, the hospitalists, um, you know, they have an important role too. It would be great if they read my note. That, that would be a good thing. It would make it easier. Um, I try to write my notes so that it's, um, it, it makes it easy for you as possible. That, you know, I give you a diagnosis. I tell you what the, the, the treatment plan is. Um, the consult note, you know, has the, the core measure stuff in there. Tells you what to do. You know, I don't always, you know, do it perfectly, of course, but that's that's the goal is to uh, is to try and just lay it out in a way that's as easy as possible for you to do the other things, uh, and then the hospital will, you know needs to manage the comorbid medical conditions. Most of these patients are going to have plenty of those, so there's there's enough work to go around for everybody. including the IT guy, because I think now this is not working anymore. Oh, okay, maybe it is. All right, so we're gonna talk about identifying uh, acute stroke. So the thing, and, and this, despite, I, you know, I think this sounds kind of simple, and I try to break it down as, like, as simple as, as possible, is, is that they have, you know, the, the sort of the defining feature of acute stroke is, is a sudden and persistent deficit. Uh, and even this sort of escapes people a lot of times, but that's really what you're looking for. And, you know, anytime you have somebody that has some sort of very abrupt onset of a neurologic problem, you know, you really should think stroke at that point. Um, you know, if they're coming in and saying my arm's weak and it's been getting progressively weak over the last month, you know, that's not going to be a stroke. Uh, and, you know, probably don't need to call a stroke alert for, for that. Uh, and so this really is, is what you're, you're listening for. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it's obvious, right? You know, they, they, you know, they're sitting there and then all of a sudden they can't use one side of their body and, you know, it's, it's still like that a half an hour later. So there you have a sudden and persistent deficit. But sometimes it's not so obvious. I mean, we get all kinds of weird stuff. You know, in particular, the, the, the more challenging ones are the, are the patients that are already admitted. Um, straight, you know, why exactly this is, I don't know. but. It's always the, the weird stuff that happens. So, you know, for example, you have somebody that is, you know, they're, they're in, you know, in Pepin, they were admitted for chest pain, and, you know, they're just getting a chest pain workup or something, and then all of a sudden they can't swallow. And this was like a, you know, 55-year-old guy, walkie-talkie, just has some chest pain, maybe he's got some coronary disease, and all of a sudden he can't swallow. You know, would you call a strokeler at that point? Would you recognize that that, maybe a stroke? I mean, maybe, maybe not. Um, but this, I mean, that's like a real example that, that we've had stuff like that. So some of these things aren't that obvious is that, well, you know, is, is swallowing, is that really, you know, is that stroke? 
But you know, really, it's it's the it's the fact that it's it's sudden, it's sudden onset and, and persistent. So if somebody says, you know, oh my finger, my hand went numb for like one second. Well, that's that's not going to be a stroke. But you know, it's persistent in the sense that it lasts, you know, minutes or more. Um, you know, these these super transient phenomenon. You know, that's that's not going to be a stroke. But but you know, you know, why else would you have sudden onset dysphagia? Um, and so that's where, why I just want to emphasize that point is that sometimes it'll be kind of weird and it won't be necessarily obvious. But, you know, like there's not really a good reason to have sudden onset dysphagia, like other than some sort of acute neurologic event. Um, so, so the, 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 this is sort of the, you know, the five warning signs of stroke. This is sort of the way that the education is being presented to the public. And so, you know, even if you are, you know, know what a stroke is and what they look like, you should just be kind of familiar with this because this is, your patients are gonna be coming and maybe talking to you using this language. And the, this is why they came to the emergency department. Um, so sudden onset weakness or numbness, um, especially on one side, sudden confusion, trouble speaking or understanding, trouble seeing out of one or both eyes, dizziness, loss of balance, or trouble walking, or sudden severe headache. So this, this is the kind of stuff that is being presented to the public in an educational thing. And, and surprisingly enough, it actually is working because I, you know, when I see people in the ER now, um, in comparison to years past, it's much more common that a patient or a family member will come in and say, well, you know, I heard that this is a sign of a stroke, and so I called 911 immediately. So, like 10 years ago, when, you know, back, like when I was just starting, or, you know, even back when I was a resident or fellow, like you didn't see that very much. And patients would sort of, they wouldn't, it wouldn't be very often that they would, they would, you know, uh, present things that way. But now it's actually much more common. So it's good that we're finally making some, you know, inroads in. Uh, and educating people because you know it's amazing like how how well the education for cardio cardiac disease has been you know you can ask anybody on the street like well like what's a heart attack or like what, how do you know somebody's having a heart attack and there's a good chance they'll be able to tell you that but a surprisingly low number of people would be able to you know tell you anything about a, a stroke or when you know somebody might be having a stroke and you know it, and it's not like stroke is a rare problem, right? I mean, it really, it happens almost as often as heart attacks, really. And yet, there's this really vast difference in education, you know, health literacy among the public. And even doctors, I mean, re realistically, you know, could, could every doctor we ask answer this question? Eh, maybe, I mean, but lots of them, maybe, maybe not. So, I mean, the pathologists are like, they're off the hook, that's okay, but like anybody who's treating clinical patients, you know. So, so that's what they're, they're, they're gonna be telling you. Um, the deficits from a stroke, um, you know, they can be kinda, you know, there's a lot of like common stuff that's easy to understand like weakness or, you know, can't talk, but um, it's sometimes you get weird and kinda conceivably you could have sort of any neurologic symptom from a, a, a stroke, you know, ref any that's referable to the brain because there, you know, there could be some sort of conceivable way that that could happen. And if you come up, you know, you think of something like totally weird, you can look up in the literature and find there's like one case report where somebody said, you know, like suddenly the patient couldn't laugh anymore. And then that was like, you know, they found some tiny little infarct somewhere. Um, but that's, you know, that's the zebras are not really what you need to worry about. The things that, you know, you should be looking for are lateralizing symptoms. Um, you know, they should conform to a vascular distribution and they're not better explained by another cause. So, you know, a good example of something that doesn't meet this, you know, description, you know, is all the encephalopathy uh, and, and, and stuff that we see, you know, in the hospital. And so those are the things you really should be thinking of is, you know, is it sudden and persistent? Is it lateralizing? You know, does this sound like a brain problem? And if, you know, if you have something like that, you know, the next step is, to, is to do something quickly. It's not to like wait and see if it gets better. Uh, you know, if you're outside the hospital, you, you need to go to the ER at that point. Uh, because, you know, calling your primary care doctor's office 
you know, it's not going to get you anywhere. You can't fix people over the phone. Um, so, so those are, I, I mean, that, I think that's really the, the, the important stuff for recognition. I mean, I, I wouldn't, you know, it's great if you can, you know, be able to understand it at a finer level, but you don't necessarily have to. You know, you don't really have to be able to say, okay, this is an MCA stroke or, you know, it's a cerebellar stroke. Like, that part I don't really need. Like, I can do that part. What, what I need from everybody else is that identification. So when, the, when something like this happens, to be able to recognize that this is a potential stroke and then, and then call us. Um, that's really, I mean, that's really the most important step in the whole process because if you don't do that, then the rest of it kind of um, doesn't work. So um, the one thing that you have to be, you should be familiar with if you're going to be treating these patients is the NIH stroke scale score. Um, I, I don't like this. Lots of people don't like this. Um, it, it's, it's problematic, uh, but it's, it has become sort of the default uh, tool that we use to judge severity, you know, for better or for worse. Um, remember that it's not a diagnostic tool. A lot of people don't understand that. It's a severity score. Um, it, is, it has no di it's diagnostic value because you know, for example, if you say, you know, a patient has a NIH score of one for numbness in their hand, well, that has a differential, right? It's a pretty broad, broad differential. I mean, they could have carpal tunnel syndrome, right? So it's, it's not intended for diagnosis. And, you know, if, if somebody's not having a stroke, then their score is zero, you know, that they're not having a stroke. Um, and so just remember, this is, this is only intended to be a severity scale. It helps. If you, if you really don't understand much about what's going on, it gives you sort of this structured way to evaluate a patient and be able to communicate things to another provider in, in a way that at least is helpful, right? So if you're a primary care doc at some outside hospital like in Lake Placid or something and you know, you have this patient that suddenly, you know, develops this problem, you know, you can do this sort of structured exam and, ha you know, be able to communicate what's going on to a neurologist for transfer or something, you know, in a way that's more meaningful than just saying, well, you know, he just ain't right, you know. Um, you know, that's, that's okay sometimes, but, it, 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 you know, little details are sometimes more helpful. Um, you know, this this is typically going to be done by the either the ED physician or the neurologist. This is something that needs to be done like you know right at the outset of the admission. So it's not necessarily going to be something that falls to the, to the responsibility of like the hospitalist. But you just need to be familiar with it that this is you know what it is, what it means, and that understand that you know somebody has to document this at some point in the chart. Um, if you and if you find that that hasn't been done, you know, you know, tell me, you know, call me up and say, hey, you moron, you you forgot to do this. Um, it, it's certainly possible uh, that somebody will forget. Um, but that's that's really what I'm trying to get at with this. Even if you you know, even if you don't remember it off the top of your head, that's fine. You know, they have a little thing you can put on your phone if you need to. Um, but um, and essentially, you know, zero is no symptoms. A high number like 30 is bad. Uh, you know, most patients that you're going to see when this is done accurately, at least, are going to be, you know, somewhere between, you know, 5 and 15. You know, those are sort of the typical numbers that you're going to see. Uh, you know, a tree stump will have a NI score of 30. It's, that's not really meaningful. You know, I see these things documented. It's like the patient is, co they're intubated and paralyzed, and so I just added up all the numbers. But, yeah, that, that's not really helpful. It's probably better in that case just to say, like, you can't do it because they're paralyzed. Um, so things that aren't a stroke, um, these, are, these are super common. Uh, the big one that I, I get a lot is encephalopathic patients. So a good way to tell when a patient is just sundowning is if they can swing at you with both arms, it's probably not a stroke. Um, you know, 90-year-old patients that are, you know, with the UTI, they're in the hospital and it's 3 a.m. and they're squirming all over the place and trying to get out of bed, probably not a stroke, uh, especially if they're able to, you know, use 
both sides of their body to get out of bed. Um, this, you know, see these, this kind of thing a lot. Um, if, if the patient comes in and the primary complaint is pain, um, that's also probably not a stroke. So here I'm mainly like pain below the neck. Um, and, uh, you know, people can have a headache with an ischemic stroke. It's, you know, it's one of those things that you see like 15% of the time or something. So it can happen, but it's not common enough that it's in any way helpful. Um, but, it, you know, if they come in and they're complaining of like limb pain or leg pain or back pain, you know, that's unlikely that that's going to turn out to be a stroke. I mean, strokes don't really hurt. And, and when people have, you know, a sensory disturbance as part of a stroke, uh, it's, it's almost always sensory loss. Um, it's a, you know, what you, you call like a negative symptom, right? It's not, they don't have, you know, pain is, is normally just not part of an acute stroke. Um, and so, you know, if they're complaining, saying, oh, you know, my arm is not, or, you know, my arm is weak and it hurts, you know, chances are that's going to be a, a problem below the neck. Um, if they have, you know, some kind of lateralizing neurologic symptom, but none of them are above the neck, you know, that's when you need to think maybe it's a spinal cord process. Um, and so and it's not that it's impossible to get this with the stroke, but, you know, more often than not, like if you have somebody, they have like left arm and leg weakness and numbness and nothing in the face, you, you at least have to consider the fact that that may be a spinal cord problem because, you know, most, the way the anatomy is arranged is, you know, you almost always get a pattern of face and arm or face, arm, and leg, you, you don't generally get a pattern that's arm and leg minus the face. Um, and th this is important especially because a lot of times what the scenario will happen is, you know, the patient comes in, they're complaining of this, it gets, you know, the person who initially sees them just thinks they're, you know, having a stroke, orders a brain MRI, a bunch of time goes by, they get the brain MRI done, lo and behold, it doesn't show anything, and the whole time is that, you know, they've got spinal cord compression and then, you know, at, you know, at C6 or something, and now they're getting worse and, you know, now the person might, you know, end up quadriplegic or something. And, you know, we've, we've used up all this time, you know, when we could have done some intervention for a, a spinal cord problem. So you, you kind of have to, in this sort of scenario, you have to have some suspicion that this, this could, you know, that's maybe not a brain problem. So especially if it's pain or it's lateralizing and misses the face, you know, really think spinal cord. Um, you know, and if you, if you have, you know, some doubt in your mind, you know, one you could call. We all have, we have cell phones, they, most of the time they work, so you could just call. Um, and even if you don't call, I mean, if you're gonna send them the MRI, order a C-spine or something, you know, it's not, not the end of the world. Um, if, especially if the person like really has a deficit, you know, it'd be better to waste a, an, well, you know, an MRI scan than it would be to, you know, end up paraplegic. Uh, another thing is bilaterally symmetric deficits, um, you know, like both feet. So, it, you know, for example, you have somebody who's a, you know, uncontrolled diabetic, their A1C is 14, and they say, you know, for the past six months I have this burning pain and numbness in my feet. That's probably not a stroke, uh, you know, that's a neuropathy. So uh, a stroke isn't gonna give you bilaterally symmetric, you know, peripheral deficits like that. Um, you, you know, that's just not the way it's gonna work out. Uh, you know, one of the really uncommon ways that you're gonna end up seeing something with bilateral symmetry is, you know, somebody has a bowel artery occlusion or something. Um, those patients are usually comatose. Uh, so they're not going to be like walking around complaining about their burning feet. Uh, so, you know, if you, if you have somebody that is, just has some sort of minor impairment that's bilaterally symmetric, it's probably not a stroke. Because there are other places in the body that can give you neurologic symptoms. Um, all right, stroke alerts, in-house stroke alerts. So I, I mention this in particular because this is, these are difficult. Um, you know, so invariably, like our door to needle time is always longer with an in-house stroke alert than it is for somebody coming through the ER. Like it's really counterintuitive and you would think that if you're already here, it would be much easier, but in fact, it's, it, it is way harder. Um, 
one, uh, you know, one thing I really want to emphasize is the importance of communication. Uh, so, t you know, the typical scenario of the way this works is some person, doctor, nurse, or somebody comes, sees the patient, sees that there's some sort of problem, and then tells somebody else to call a stroke alert, and then they hightail it out of there and you can't find them. So, you know, then rapid response comes to see the patient and they probably get almost no information and then they say, well, you know, it looks like the person's not moving their left side, so I'm gonna call a stroke alert. So, they call a stroke alert, I show up, see the patient, and the patient, you know, is, you know, nonverbal, 90 years old, demented, and, you know, and nobody can tell me any information. Half the time I can't even really figure out why they called the stroke alert. You can't reach anybody. Nobody knows like why the patient's in the hospital or whether, you know, is that left-sided weakness new? And, you know, so this is the typical way it plays out. I mean, I'm not really exaggerating. Um, so the really, you remember, like remember, this is a stack consult and just like any other stack consult, you know, it's hospital policy. There needs to be a doctor-doctor communication. Um, and because it makes it really difficult for me to help you if you if I can't figure out what's going on in a timely fashion. And you know, somebody that's been in the hospital for 36 days, like, you know, it's not always easy to like pick through the chart and really figure out what's going on in like a couple of minutes. So communication is really super important for this and it'll make it much easier for me to be able to, you know, to to help you and help the patient. Um, Please also, somebody needs to assess the patient for stability of their ABCs before they go for head CT. So I just want to remind everybody that C head CTs are not curative. They, they do not prevent stroke or save lives. It's, you know, it provides you useful information you may be able to use to treat the patient, but the scan itself is not sort of life-saving or curative. And so if the patient is in respiratory distress and like blue, that's probably not the time to take them for the head CT. Um, you would be surprised how many stroke alerts become code blues because really the problem was the patient was in respiratory distress and they were getting encephalopathic because they're hypoxic and so, and then like halfway to CT, you know, that's it's a code blue and people are like bagging the patient doing chest compression. So, you know, Really, the, the patient needs to be assessed, you know, for stability before going to head CT. And if there's any doubt about that, you know, stabilize the patient um, before taking them to a head CT. The other thing, you know, if there's no chance that there's going to be any acute intervention, really, this is a time to just have a talk with a neurologist or something first. So, you know, an example of that, 95-year-old woman, metastatic breast cancer, on hospice in the hospital, and, you know, somebody thinks she has a facial droop. Okay, let's take a step back here for a moment, okay? Are, are we gonna give this patient TPA? Are we gonna take them to the angio suite? No. So, in that case, just make a phone call, you know, and, and talk about it because are we gonna help this lady to drag her down for a head CT and then drag her all the way back and you know, uh, you know maybe she stops breathing when you lay her flat on the table because she's got you know, bilateral plural, malignant pleural fusions. You know. So you know, just use some common sense and you know, if, if really there's, it, it would just be totally unreasonable to do something, then just have a conversation first and don't call a stroke alert. Um, you know, and if you're wrong and you call and it's something and they say, you can always just call the stroke alert afterwards. You know, um, I answer my phone, so it's not like it's gonna be hard to you know, get a hold of one of us uh, if this happens. Our, yeah. Uh, it can, yeah, I mean, it can be anybody. I mean, the way the process is supposed to work is that if it's something identified by a nurse, they're supposed to call rapid response, and then, you know, rapid response is the one that initiates it. You, you're right. A lot of time it's not a doctor. Um, it, you know, it's somebody else. Um, and, yeah, I don't remember you calling one either, so I, you know, <laughs> I believe you. But, and, and, and so I, and, but this message is kind of for everybody is that, like, you know, a lot of times what I, I, 
it, it's more often, you know, when this is sort of nurse generated, and then, you know, you have these people that are being drugged down for a head CT, and then, like, I can't even find the patient because they're in some, like, elevator, like, way over on, like, 5 South or something, and then, you know, and lots of times, like, there, there was no reason to do all that stuff, and, I, and so I just want people to kind of, like, take a deep breath, you know, Think about it for like 10 seconds, and uh, and then if there's any doubt, just just call because then you know maybe we can avoid doing a bunch of unnecessary stuff for people. Um, and but really, you know, a lot of times the biggest problem is like just trying to figure out what's going on with the patient, um, and it's it's surprisingly hard to do, especially to try and figure out like quickly in a short amount of time. I mean, yeah, you can sit down with a chart for half an hour and then finally figure out somebody documented two weeks ago that the patient hasn't been moving their left side for years. But, you know, getting that information like quick and timely is, is really tough. So, any other questions so far? Really just advocating like a common sense approach to it. That's all. All right. So we're going to talk about acute interventions. So once you, you know, once you've identified that somebody is having a stroke, uh, the, the next step is to figure out, well, is there some sort of, you know, acute or emergent intervention we can do to prevent the, you know, the patient having a stroke? The reason we do this is that, you know, when cerebral blood flow drops below a certain threshold, uh, the deficits will appear suddenly. Um, but there's a window where between how severe that blood flow reduction is, where the, the tissue may still be salvageable. So on the average, if you're talking about average uh, brain tissue, like once the blood flow drops below 50 milliliters per milligram uh, or per cubic centimeter or whatever, uh, it, you know, that's when the symptoms start to, start to appear. Uh, but it's not till maybe about 2018 uh, before the, that tissue is irreversibly uh, ischemic and dies. So there's this window where they're going to be symptomatic, but they're potentially salvageable. And so that's, that's what we're trying to intervene to prevent, um, you know, the patient from having the stroke. So there's this concept in the, called the penumbra, which is, you know, what we're going after. That's the tissue at risk. Um, that's going to determine, you know, the extent of the deficits that they're that they're left with. So that that's the term that you're going to see used to um, describe this. So acute stroke treatment, you know, consists of you know a rapid assessment uh, and, and you know and treatment to try and reduce that morbidity. Uh, you know, we have a very narrow time window uh, before the brain undergoes infarction. And, and the goal is to, is to restore that blood flow. Um, you know, this really needs to be thought of much more like a cardiac arrest. Um, this isn't, a, you know, it's less dramatic than a cardiac arrest a lot of times. And, and I think that's one of the barriers to kind of getting people sort of on board with the idea that you need to react quickly to this. Um, but it really, it's really the same thing. You know, it's just like a STEMI cardiac arrest timeline is very similar uh, and which is pretty narrow. So the first line treatment um, and really the until you know much more recently you know the only sort of real effective uh, intervention for acute stroke is, is IVTPA. Um, this is still the standard of care. Um, this has not been replaced by endovascular therapy. You know we'll talk about that um, as well. But the first step is still to, to, you know, is to determine whether the patient's a candidate for IVTPA and then to give that as, as, soon, as soon as possible. So um, one thing that has, you know, happened about this is now that there's become this focus on this time window. Um, the time window originally uh, was just, was three hours um, with, you know, with its set of inclusion and exclusion criteria. More recently, uh, some additional studies have been done that have uh, led to an extension of that time window to three to four and a half hours with some little bit more restrictive criteria. That actually, you know, it hasn't changed practice here very much. We just don't get very many people coming in like in that extra additional window. It, it, most of the people, it's either gonna be, they come in right away or they come in like 12 hours or the next day. 
So we're not really getting very many people in that extra window, but, but that does exist. Um, but the thing to really remember about that, that doesn't mean that you can, like, you know, the person showed up 20 minutes after the stroke happened, and, you know, oh, there's still time for lunch. You know, we got three hours. Like, it doesn't work that way. Uh, this is just like a STEMI, right? It's like there, there may be some sort of cutoff where at some point, you know, you may not use a particular therapy, but always the sooner you give that therapy, the better, right? Uh, and that's, you know, clearly, you know, the case with all the studies that are shown, you know, with uh, acute stroke per treatment. Um, one thing I just want to point out, you know, about the cardiac arrest, everybody gets all excited, you know, if there's a cardiac arrest in the ER, every person is like in that room, the rest of the ER is like a ghost town, you know, you can't find anybody. <laughs> And, but you know, after all that drama, all those resources that are thrown at, I mean, the, the average survival for an out of hospital cardiac arrest is 6% still. So just, you know, put things in perspective here. You know, the chance to recover without disability after TPA is one in 10 if you get treated in the first three hours. So that's 10%. So, you know, why not get kind of excited about this? Because, you know, you've, you've got actually a much better chance statistically of, you know, of really helping the patient, you know. 94% of those people that come with a cardiac arrest are gonna die. And so, and it's, I'm not saying we shouldn't treat them, it's just, you know, there's just this vast different in interest in terms of, of how we think about these two disease processes, so. So contraindications, um, you know, obviously TPA is, you know, it's a, it's a fibrinolytic, so it, it has the potential to make you bleed. Um, there are uh, a, you know, a whole set of contraindications that are sort of set out by the manufacturer. Originally, when the, after the studies were first done, there was this big, long list um, that would have been like three slides long. Um, more recently, thankfully, there have been subsequent studies done where they were able to go back and kind of show there was no reason for this particular thing to be a contraindication because it really didn't affect anything. And so the list has really been, been pared down a lot. Um, and so that's, that's really helpful because, you know, when there's 38 contraindications, like who's going to remember that, you know? So um, really the, the big ones and the most common one that we deal with is time. So you're outside the time window. Um, that actually is far and away the most important thing for preventing complication is getting that time correct. Um, and that is a surprisingly difficult thing to do. Um, even like if, even if you have like a family member that can talk and let's say the patient's aphasic and he can't talk but the family member's right there and asking them, you know, when were they last normal? That's the question you have to ask, not when did it start? because invariably what people will tell you is the time that they discovered the symptoms. And they won't tell you, well, I haven't seen him for three hours, or he woke up this way, last time I saw him normal was last night. They'll tell you hey, this, if the stroke started at 8 a.m. because that's when I discovered the symptoms. And plenty of people, even after you explain it to them three or four or five times, still can't understand the difference between time of discovery and last known well time. Um, and this, this is why you see complications after TPA, is you get the time wrong. Um, and so you really kind of have to be like a, a detective here and really interrogate somebody to really pin them down as to when it happened, because this is why people bleed, uh, is that you, you get the time wrong. Um, aside from the time, the, you know, the other contraindications, thrombocytopenia, you know, officially they use 100,000. We don't check the platelet count before, you know. The only time you really would want to do that is if the patient comes in and they're like covered in ecchymosis and they say they've got, you know, multiple myeloma or something and, you know, the platelet, you know, last week their platelet count is four. Okay, yeah, that person you're gonna wait for the platelet count or something. But, you know, somebody that doesn't have any kind of history like that, it's, you know, they, the recommendation is not to check the platelet count first. If they're on full dose Lovenox or any of the new oral anticoagulants within the last 48 hours, they're, they're not a candidate. 
Um, the Lovenox thing was uh, introduced, uh, I think, two years ago, and they weren't really clear about whether that was the prophylactic dose or not, and so they kind of realized their mistake and have come back and say, no, what we we're really talking about is full dose anticoagulation. So if they got their 40 sub Q of Lovenox for DVT prophylaxis, that's not a contraindication. So that's a clarification that just was just made. Um, if they're on Coumadin, the INR is greater than 1.5 or so, that's also a, a contraindication. Um, just a reminder, you can't use uh, COAG studies for determining whether somebody is anticoagulated with the new drugs. Yes, they're sort of abnormal, but it's not reliable. Uh, and so you, that's going to be based entirely on the history and has nothing to do with the lab. So if they tell you, you know, I took my Eliquis, you know, last night and it's the next morning, they're not a candidate. doesn't matter what their coax are. Uh, and then recent surgeries, the really the ones to worry about are chest surgeries. Like if somebody had a knee replacement or, you know, a tympanoplasty on their ear, we had one of those recently, like that's not a contraindication. Um, but it's the chest chest stuff that's really the problem because, you know, if you suddenly get like a massive hemothorax, like that's pretty bad, um, you probably die. Uh, or if you get a, you know, cardiac tamponade or something, I mean, I've heard of that, that kind of thing happening. You know, so that's stuff that'll like kill you really fast. And those are the kind of things you want to avoid. But, you know, for example, like we, uh, not, uh, maybe a month or two ago, I had a lady that had just had a tympanoplasty in like her eardrum, right? And, um, and they, the ENT had taken her off her Coumadin, you know, because they had to the surgery, blah, blah, blah. And so she had a fib, and of course she had a stroke, and so we gave her TPA. And yeah, you know, they had to put some cotton in her ear, and she had like a little bit of blood come out. But, you know, you know, big stroke versus a little bit of blood coming out of your ear. So that's the kind of thing you just have to like put in perspective. Um, you know, if, if the bleeding complication would be rapidly fatal, then yeah, you probably don't want to take that risk. But, you know, like a knee replacement or a bunion surgery. Uh, the dental procedures are super common. I we get those all the time. Um, those things, not a big deal. Yeah, they'll bleed a little bit, but whatever. They'll be fine. Any questions about that? Does that all kind of make sense? Remember, all bleeding stops. It'll be okay. So, um, so our performance metric for this is the door to needle time. Uh, the time patient rolls in the door to the time the bolus of TPA is given. Uh, that time is supposed to be 60 minutes or less. Um, and, you know, the speed really makes a difference. So for, you know, every 30 minutes faster treatment, you know, 8% greater odds of walking independently at discharge, that's kind of a big deal. Um, you know, 6% greater odds of being discharged home instead of an institution. That's kind of a big deal. So that's why the time, you know, really matters. Why we, you know, focus so much on that. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, even even with 60 minutes, uh, to, uh, you know, door to needle time, which when you when you actually start doing this and looking at this in detail, it's it's an amazingly long time. Um, but even with that, um, that time rarely gets met. Uh, you know. So in these uh, big stroke registries, you know, the, the median time was 67 minutes. Uh, and despite participating in a registry for nine years, there was really kind of no statistical change with that. But that's, that's like a ridiculously long time. I mean, 67, 67, I mean, that's longer than I've been talking. I mean, it's, you know, it's forever. Um, so in, you know, in the US, we, uh, most hospitals are participate with a program called Get With a Guideline Stroke. Um, and so, but even with this, I mean, it was only like 50% of hospitals, despite sort of saying, you know, we're a stroke center, we're going to participate in this quality improvement program. Even then, it's only like 50%. Um, so, you know, but it really can be done. And, and it actually, you know, it, it, it's really not that hard. Um, and so these are our times. So this, uh, started in uh, 2014. I haven't updated this slide. I don't, I don't know, what's our average time now? It's about the same, right? Yeah, so, um, so back in 2014 was when I kind of just started. The time was uh, about 75 minutes uh, and, uh, you know, and then got, 
you know, progressively better from that. And so now we're still right around half an hour or so. Um, and that's actually probably uh, more or less, you know, with our sort of mixed and random patient population, that's, that's realistically probably about, you know, give or take a few minutes where it's, it's going to be. Um, you know, this uh, same thing, uh, door to needle times between, uh, you know, 2016 until 2018. So this is a little bit more updated. Uh, and I just broke it down by mo month here. And, you know, so what you can see is that, you know, sometimes you're going to have an average time in like, that's like 15 or 20 minutes, and then there'll be a little bit, some will be a little bit longer. Um, and, uh, but somewhere right around half an hour is, I think, a pretty reasonable goal for a place that is doing what they're supposed to do. Um, you know, the next sort of what we're, you know, trying to push for is, you know, a door to needle time in less than 20 minutes. Um, and this is, you know, this is something that we, you know, are currently able to do here. Um, but it's also, you know, other places that are, are doing a good job, you know, can do this too. It, we're not unique in this. Um, and there's been a little bit of this showing up in the literature. Um, so, you know, it's, it's out there. Um, you know, in the right circumstances, we're consistent, you know, routinely doing this. Um, and, but you can't always do this because there, you know, there are certain reasons and we'll kind of get into that. Um, the first response to this is always like, you know, like, oh my God, like, you know, if you talk to somebody that's, you know, has an 80 minute door to needle time, they, oh, you just can't, can't make it any better can't be done. The other response is, you know, you're just killing people, right? You, you're doing it too fast. This is, you know, hysterics, you know, people fall on the ground, have a convulsion. So um, this is, you know, stuff like this, you're seeing, you know, people commentary, um, you know, oh my God, you're killing people. This is just recklessness, you know, can't be done. Well, it can, and so our, you know, risk of, you know, actual symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage as a complication of TPA, it's less than 2%. Um, it's probably about 1% maybe. It's, uh, it's safer than a heparin drip. Uh, it's safer than plenty of the other things that we routinely do to people. Uh, the, the risk of having a major GI bleed that lands you in the hospital with a transfusion by taking aspirin is more than 1%. Uh, so, you know, in, to put it in the scheme of things, it's like, you know, it, it's, it's not risk-free, of course, but it really, it has, you know, a similar risk profile to things that we don't really think twice about. Uh, so, you know, we shouldn't get too excited about it. And even when we're giving it to people in 20 minutes, you know, these are still the results that we're seeing. And again, we're not unique in this. Uh, this is, there are plenty of places that do this. Um, so, and you know, what you'll see quoted about the risk is they'll say something like, you know, 6% risk of hemorrhage or something. But in reality, what it is, is that at places that know what they're doing, the risk is pretty close to zero. And in places that don't know what they're doing, the risk is like 15%. So when you average it out, you get a number like six, but it's not really reflective of reality. It really, you know, so, uh, but, you know, if you're, if you're getting a, a you know, a, even if you were hitting a 6% risk of hemorrhage, you're definitely doing something wrong. Like, you know, if places who do this routinely can be like 2% or less, then, you know, like there must be something, you must be doing something wrong, if, even if you're hitting that quoted average. But the reality is, is those places that are having all these complications, they're actually probably like 10 or 15%. So um, symptomatic hemorrhage after TPA does have a specific definition. It's not just kind of like whatever we make up on any given day. So that official uh, definition is a four point increase in the NIH stroke scale score within 36 hours and a new hemorrhage seen on CT. This is important because uh, there's lots of times where people will have asymptomatic hemorrhages and by, you know, they're asymptomatic, right? So if you have a little bit of oozing within a bed of dead tissue, like who cares, right? It doesn't hurt anything. That tissue's dead. It doesn't really care whether there's a little bit of blood in it or not. Um, and you can have asymptomatic hemorrhages 
whether or not you get TPA or whether, you know, it, it happens, right? It happens slightly more often with TPA, but it, that doesn't necessarily mean anything to the outcome. So, um, so, you know, we don't really worry about that. So here's um, uh, another, uh, you know, paper in the literature uh, where, you know, this was part of the Target Stroke Program, which is another kind of initiative for American uh, stroke Association and what they were looking at, you know, a large uh, urban academic center, they had an average door needle of 29 minutes, their hemorrhage rate 2.7 percent. So again, you know, this is not like a fairy tale, this is like what is actually happening at, at places where they're doing it right. And, and they, you know, so they get very similar numbers to us. Um, Again, it's another poster presentation reporting 2%. So, you know, 2% numbers kind of like seems to be fairly what you, do, you know, you typically see in a, in a competent place, somewhere around that number, right? Um, and, and really the problem is, is like, you know, just trying to understand the difference between like it's physically impossible versus, you know, you just can't do it because you want to keep doing it the wrong way. Um, and so, you know, you have to be kind of open to change in order to, to get, you know, get to this point. Um, so, you know, it can be done, it can be done safely, and it's really actually not very hard. Um, it, it isn't rocket science. It isn't even brain surgery, like, really. Um, so, the way that we do it, um, the most important thing is showing up. So, not much happens if nobody shows up. Um, this, um, this is probably the number one reason why P hospitals can't do it, is that nobody shows up. So, you know, the EMS brings the patient in on a stretcher, they park him in a room, and then, it, you know, 20 minutes go by while the patient's, you know, choking on their vomit and aspirating, and, you know, and, you know, somebody comes in, takes a set of vitals, says the doctor will be right with you. 45 minutes later, the ER doc comes in and goes, oh, wow, they're having a stroke. So showing up really is, is the most important thing. Um, so, you know, we get pre-notification from EMS. Um, so in theory, we know about this ahead of time before they're coming. You know, we do have a doc first process in the ER some of the time. Uh, and, uh, you know, so the patient gets, gets screened right away. I mean, here I think, you know, despite the limitations, you know, we actually do a, a very good job of identifying these people very quickly. Uh, and then, then it, so after you've shown up, you do a very brief exam. And again, really the goal of that is just, does it look like they're having a stroke? And do they have a, like a stable airway so I can take them to CT? So again, just a, like really brief ABCs. You know, om, you know, very often that's, it's just gonna take a minute, that's it. Then you take them to CT. Uh, and then what you, you know, then you gotta kinda, stay on the ball, stay with the patient, uh, and then quickly make a decision uh, about what you're gonna do and start mixing the TPA, and then give it. Uh, and then after all that is when you do your advanced imaging for appropriate patients. Uh, so it's, it's a simple process, but it is different than the normal ER process. So, um, you know, like I said, we get stroke alerts from the field. Um, you know, I try to get down to the ER as soon as I can, uh, wait for the patient to arrive. We, you know, we have sort of changed things a bit so that now we don't do the stroke alert notification until the patient actually hits the door because prior to this, what was happening is like the patient would be in Pasco County and like they would call it a half an hour in advance and he'd stand around and then everybody would get bored and leave and then when the patient actually did show up, nobody was there. So, so now we do it, and it's, it works fine because it, like, it really doesn't take time to get down there, assuming the elevators are working. Um, and then if the patient comes through the front door, you know, they're, they're be typically seen by doc first, and then they'll you know, initiate a stroke alert right from there. So uh, again, you, know, you just did that brief exam. You know, you're not doing a full NIH stroke score here. That's not the point. Um, is just enough that are they stable enough to go to CT and eyeball them and does it look like they're having a stroke? Uh, and as long as that's the case, take them to CT. Uh, that, that whole process takes a minute, you know, maybe two minutes. 
Uh, but that's it. You know, it, it, it's perfect. You know, if EMS is there, you can get the history from EMS. It all happens, you know, really fast. The only, the only test, that, other test that we do is a finger stick before they go to that. That's the only, like, lab test that we do. Um, the key facts that we need to obtain is, is this presentation consistent with a stroke? Like, does it even sound like a stroke? You don't have to be perfect at this point, but, like, you know, is this something that happened acutely? You know, if they say they, you know, they've had a headache for six months, yeah, that's, you know, we can maybe hold on a few minutes. So, and the really, the mo again, the most important thing is last known well time. And again, you know, you really have to be like a detective and, you know, how do you know this time? Is it reliable? Very common scenario is patient brought from nursing home. Staff says patient, the stroke started at 9 a.m. Okay. And when you actually talk to EMS, you, you know, how did you get this? Oh, well, somebody just told me that. Well, is that the person who saw the patient? No, they didn't. That wasn't the person who saw the patient. Well, how did they know when it started? Oh, I don't know. I have no idea. So, and then, you know, so if you get some information like that, you just have to throw it out. If it's not reliable, because literally their life is going to depend on this data. And so, and you know, and with the nursing home ones, you know, typically what happens is, yeah, they've got left-sided weakness, but that's why they're in the nursing home, why they've been there for three years is because they had that stroke three years ago. You know, so that happens all the time. And, you know, but every once in a while those people get TPA and then, you know, then they have problems and so. But really, that's really the most important thing is making sure you understand that. You gotta know how you know that, how that person knew that, so that you can be confident that it's, it's real. Uh, and then whether the patient's taking any anticoagulant. And remember, we're not talking about aspirin and Plavix. Antiplatelet drugs are fine. It's anticoagulant drugs. So it's Coumadin, new oral anticoagulants, you know, full dose heparin or Lovenox, and that's it. Uh, and then any recent surgeries or medical history that might be a contraindication for TPA. Even, you know, even when the patient can't talk, you can figure this out pretty easily. Just take the shirt off. You know, if they've got a big scar down the middle of their chest or like, you know, they just had a thoracotomy and there's this big scar on the, like, you know, it's most like major chest stuff is gonna be pretty obvious from the outside. So even if they can't tell you, you can, you know, you can answer, you answer that. Um, so then, you, then they're gonna go straight to CT. You know, really, if you wanna do this well, the, what you need to do is you need to stay with the patient is, Go, you know, don't leave, don't go do something else and get distracted for half an hour and come back, you know. Uh, you know, do not, you know, you can't wait for radiology to read this. You have to stay with the patient and, you know, be able to make your decision as fast as possible. So what we do, the patient goes on the EMS stretcher into CT. They go onto the CT table. Um, we have an ER bed waiting, so they get their CT. I read the CT, like, right when they do it on the scanner. You, you know, make a decision there. And again, the, really what you need to do is do they have a hemorrhage or not? And if they don't, you move forward. Patient goes off the CT table onto the ER stretcher, they get weighed, and then they go back to the room and you, and you start mixing the TPA. So again, you know, you have to stay with the patient. You know, the biggest problem that ERs have is attention deficit disorder. So, you know, the average time that the ER doc stays focused on one patient for any continuous amount of time, it's probably like two minutes. And then they go do something else, and then they come back. And, you know, you don't, you know, because you're occupied that whole time, they, you know, you just don't have an appreciation for how long that all takes. And, you, you know, and realistically, you know, with, with these patients, you really, you know, you can do this whole process in 20 minutes. So you don't, it's not like you have to spend three hours with the patient. You just need to spend, you know, like 20 minutes continuous time and then you're done. As opposed to, you know, two minutes here, two minutes there, and then before you know it, it's been an hour and a half and you haven't given the TPA yet. So you gotta check the blood pressure. There's a cutoff, uh, 185 over 110. And, uh, you know, if they are over that, you know, you give them a little betalol or something just to bring it down below that before you start. Um, consent is not required, uh, and this is also part of the recommendation of the guidelines. You know, you, you, does anybody obtain consent for heparin drip? All right, so heparin drip has a higher complication rate than a TPA, so why, why do you feel like 
you must do this for TPA when you don't do it for other things that are actually riskier. Um, and so it is the standard of care. Really what you need to get consent for is refusal of TPA. So if somebody says they don't want it, that's when you want to make them sign something that says they're refusing treatment because you're on the liability side, you, you are 10 times more likely to be found liable for something for not giving TPA than, than giving it. Um, you know, this is published in the literature and you know, uh, is sort of the reality of the situation. Here, we're lucky enough to have pharmacy help us, so they, you know, most of the time during the day, so they mix the TPA or whoever is going to do it starts mixing it. Um, and while all that's going on, you can finish your NIH stroke scale score and, you know, tidy up some other historical details while that TPA is getting mixed, and then you, you know, and then you give it uh, as soon as you can. So. For certain patients that are going to meet criteria for potential endovascular treatment, that's when we are going to send them back for uh, advanced imaging. So back when we first started doing this, maybe about 10 years ago, everybody got so excited about endovascular treatment that they were taking people, you know, we would take people to CT and do a CTA and a perfusion at that time. But what we found is that the door to needle time increased substantially. Even though like the scan really only takes five minutes maybe, you would think like, oh, well, it's only going to add five minutes to the clock, but in reality what it did is it, you know, it added more like 35 minutes to the clock. And the problem is, is IV access, you know, sorting all that out, you know, patients that need endovascular therapy almost never have good veins. So they sit down there forever. You're, you know, it takes 20 minutes just to get a peripheral IV in them. Then that one blows. Then you got to put it in again. That's how you get the 30, 40 minute delay in your door to needle times. So, you know, after noticing that, we switched to, to always doing the advanced imaging after the TPA if they were going to potentially be a TPA candidate. Uh, and now that actually has finally sort of caught up and is the is the recommendation from the guidelines as well. So they get their TPA first if they're a candidate. If they're not going to be a TPA candidate and you know that, then that's fine. You can go ahead and just, if you want to get the advanced imaging, you can do it then because you're not delaying anything. Um, but uh, we, you know, now that we have two uh, CT scanners in the ER, sometimes we can give TPA in the, actually in the scanner. So if we have pharmacy there and everything's all ready to go, we can hand, you know, give the bolus hang TPA right on the CT table. Uh, and go. I mean, that's how you get like, you know, eight or nine minute door to needle time is you do stuff like that. Um, you know, it works. You, you know, you can pull it off uh, sometimes. So it's this, you know, it's not always possible to get these really low times. The probably the most common reason is blood pressure too high or unable to obtain a history. So, you know, patient shows up, they're globally aphasic, there's no family. EMS just shrugs when you ask them what happened. They say, you know, and, and I'm not digging EMS, like, like literally like a lot of times what happens is like somebody calls EMS and they get there and say, well, what happened? And then and someone just goes, I don't know, he just ain't right. And, and so they, you know, that's all they have, you know? And so they tell us what they have, but it's like, it's just nothing, right? And so, you know, and then the patient will sit there for 20 or 30 minutes and then some family member shows up and goes, oh yeah, no, this just happened, you know, an hour ago. So in cases like that, you know, you can't really necessarily do it any faster, and it, that's just the limitation of reality. It, it's nothing you can do about it. Um, but um, so that's really uh, what it is. You know, sometimes we get into trouble with, like, not being able to confirm their medication. So, for example, like, you look in the Cerner and it says they just filled their bottle of Elquis, you know, three days ago, and then, you know, you finally eventually figure out, oh, but they've never taken a single pill. Like, they just filled a prescription and they've never taken it. So, overwhelmingly, these um, anticoagulant failures are, are just failures because somebody didn't put the pill in their mouth. Um, you know, I can, since these drugs came out, you know, I think I could probably count the number of people that really sort of truly had a, a failure, had a, you know, a cardioembolism on one of these drugs, maybe on one hand. You know, it happens, but, it's really rare, um, and so if you, you know, so you have to kind of ask, like, are they actually taking it? So, and then sometimes you get weird presentations and you're just not sure that it's a stroke at first. So, 
Um, you know, the reason why most places can't do this, uh, they just have a one size fits all model. They have the same process for every patient that comes in an ED. You know, doesn't matter whether you're there for, you know, a stroke or whether you're there because you need a refill on your birth control pills. You know, same process uh, and it just sort of plods along. And people need to realize you have to treat this different. You know, you need to treat this like the cardiac arrest or like the STEMI. Uh, and that's, you know, it's just, a, it's just a mental adjustment that you have to make in order to, to get this to work. Um, the key things, you know, for speed and safety is the decision maker, you know, the person who's gonna ultimately decide whether to give them PPA or not, you know, they need to be involved as soon as possible, you know, preferably like, you know, as soon as the patient hits the door. So that gives you that your time to make sure you got all your information you need, right? You know, if you, if the patient's there for like, you know, 90 minutes before you even get called, then you're like, you're behind the eight ball at that point and you're rushing and you're trying to do it and, it, and it's, that's where you get into trouble. But if you're there from the moment they hit the door, you know, you have that 20 minutes to just have, assess what you're getting and you can make a good decision. Um, and, you know, and really you gotta, this is critical care. So you have to stay focused and not do anything else. So that's really, you know, that's the definition of critical care, right? You know, when you look at the billing definition is that you are, you're solely devoted to taking care of that patient and you're not doing anything else. And there's, there's a reason for that. Because if you're doing 12 other things, then, you know, you're not really providing critical care. So, um, you know, there's this golden 20 minutes, you know, I don't, this hasn't really caught on yet. I'm still waiting for it, maybe it will, but, um, the important thing, there's no waiting in stroke. So if you're trying to make a decision or you're, you know, let's, maybe we'll do this, maybe we'll wait, just, just remember, there's no waiting. So the choice of waiting is always the wrong choice. You know, you need to move forward with the process and do things as fast as you can. Um, is like a STEMI or trauma. Um, all right, any questions on that? So we, you know, we can treat the proximal segment M1 uh, and proximal M2. Um, basically, that is sort of the main trunk of the MCA and the, the first sort of big branches that come out of that. So we, we you know, the catheters and, and the devices are just too big to go much more distal than that. Um, and then like the other case he showed, you know, we can treat basal artery uh, problems as well. So what the takeaway from this is that just because you're having a stroke doesn't mean you're an endovascular candidate. There's only certain vessels we can treat. The good news is the, the ones that we can treat are generally the one, the biggest, that cause the biggest stroke and the most, uh, the, you know, the most disability. Those are the ones we, you know, can treat. The other criteria is, you know, they need to have an open path to get to the target vessel. So this is why you can't treat a carotid, a patient has a carotid occlusion, you can't treat an MCA because you can't get there. Um, and you say, well, why don't you just try and open the carotid? Well, you know, people have tried that. It just doesn't, it doesn't turn out well. Um, so back in the Wild West days when this stuff was just started to be done, you know, uh, people would do stuff like this. You know, interventional radiologists, a lot of them tend to be kind of cowboys and they will like try anything. They'll be like, yeah, I can do that with a catheter. But, you know, and that might be sort of true, except at some point you realize, well, just because you can do that with a catheter, that's not in the patient's best interest. So, so people would do stuff like, you know, throw a, throw a stent in the carotid to open it up and then try and go after the clot. Well, the bottom line is, is that outcomes were bad when, when you did stuff like that. And so now, you know, this has sort of become, you know, part of the, you know, accepted standard and part of the guidelines is, you know, if they have a carotid occlusion, you don't, you don't go out, you, you know, that's it. You can't do endovascular treatment. So, so that's uh, one thing they have to keep in mind too. Um, so we, now that, um, now, so up until about what was two years ago when this Dawn trial uh, and uh, the other one came out, we, we didn't really have a firm set of criteria, so we, we did what was, we thought was reasonable, but there wasn't some sort of official um, set of criteria. And, and we were doing the endovascular treatment long before these trials were done because it was really obvious that it worked. So, you know, for example, you know, if you have people that come in and that have an M1 occlusion, 
like those people, like they're always going to have a, 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 a non-ideal outcome, right? Those people always did poorly. So, you know, even when these, you know, early devices came out, and even though they didn't work perfectly, like if you, you know, if you were able to treat like one out of 10 of them, that's still one out of 10 that was never going to happen before. So, you know, so even before, you know, it was still a, still a big deal. So it was really obvious this was effective early on and we were doing this before, you know, the real trials came out. But the, you know, the nice thing about the, now that we, this is sort of quote unquote official and we have these things is now we have a, a set of criteria that we can, we can use and then people aren't really gonna argue over, over it and say, well, you know, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? Uh, so this, this, I think it's really helpful. We have like a firm set of criteria. So uh, time of onset less than 24 hours. This is where it gets kind of weird because what we're, what's happening is we're moving away from the clock as a criteria because it's just arbitrary, right? That's just like an average amount of time where you know you'll have a certain percentage of people that will you know will benefit from it, but it doesn't tell you anything about the individual patient. So we're moving away from time, and now we're looking at individual physiology, which is what the CT perfusion is for. So we can take that patient and say, is this tissue salvageable or not? We don't have to go based on some sort of average. Um, and so, although yes, technically, you know, you can go up to 24 hours, maybe 48 hours for a posterior circulation stroke. Really, it's the, it's the time isn't the issue. The time is whether the tissue is salvageable. And in, in, in realistically, you know, you're very rarely going to come across people with that have been truly you know, ischemic for 24 hours and are still salvageable. Like that, it, it happens maybe, but that's not going to be the norm. For the most part, you know, most of these people you know, that are salvageable are still gonna be more in that time range that's closer to like the, the TPA time range, like, you know, six hours or less. Um, and it gets also hard to how do you, like how do you explain a time window when somebody went to sleep and wakes up symptomatic? Do you say like, well, eight hours, like do I subtract eight hours because they slept eight hours or, you know, it just gets kind of messy. So, you know, we evaluate people that are wake up strokes and, you know, we'll, we will treat them if they're, they have salvageable, um, you know, tissue. There's, you know, th and this applies to endovascular treatment. It doesn't apply to TPA because TPA, you still need that firm time window. But actually now people are finally getting the courage to do uh, perfusion guided TPA studies. And it looks like probably the next time the, the you know, next set of criteria come out, it, we're probably going to be able to do that for TPA too, but that's not quite ready for prime time yet. So they, they need to have a clinical exam consistent with a proximal large vessel occlusion. So remember, these are big strokes. This is not like somebody who says, like, my pinky's numb or maybe, you know, maybe their face is weak. You know, maybe is it the left side? Is it the right side? Like, that's not what we're going after here. So these are people that are going to have... Uh, typically going to have a stroke scale score greater than five. You know, most commonly it's going to be people that like they're like a 10 or a 14 or something like that. There's this alternative scale that is sort of based on the NIH stroke scale called the RACE score. It's just sort of like a simplified version of it. Um, and we kind of, you know, have advocated for that, like, you know, for the ER doctors, they get something simple that they can do um, to you know, to decide whether this is a proximal large vessel occlusion or not. The other important thing is that they have a pre-stroke modified Rankin score of zero or one. So uh, if you're not, you know, out, does anybody know what a modified Rankin score is? It, it's not like super popular, but it is sort of the one that is typically used for brain related conditions. And so essentially what that means, you know, you don't even have to know all the details, but basically they're walkie talkie. So a zero or one means they're, they're like independent at baseline. So, and then it goes, score goes up to six, six is dead. Um, but you know, up to five, you know, if a person has a five means they're like bed bound, you know, totally dependent, like, you know, but you don't have to know all the details. It's just, are, what, is this person functional at, at baseline? And the reason is, is that what you see in like these people that are, that don't meet that criteria is that even when you, 
successfully revascularize them and you minimize the amount of stroke that they have, they still do very poorly. And they just are not able to bounce back from even a relatively small stroke. Because even when this treatment is like very successful, they still have some infarct. You know, very rarely you, will you get it where they just, they don't have anything, right? But most of the time you save like 90% of the tissue. And you know, and if somebody is in good shape uh, at baseline, they, they may be in, still in really good shape, but it's not that they have like zero infarct. But you know, people that are like 90 and like they've already had two strokes and they're in a wheelchair, like that person's just not gonna do well whether you revascularize them or not. And so that's why they've included this. And, and I've seen this in real life too. I mean, I've seen enough people now that, that sort of didn't really meet this criteria and you treat them and even though we got a great result, you know, the patient still died you know, because they just, you know, they got an aspiration pneumonia and they just couldn't, they couldn't bounce back from it. So, you know, we do that CTA, you know, we're looking at, uh, for a causative occlusion in one of those locations. And then the CT perfusion is done right after that. And, you know, we're looking for, for salvageable tissue with a minimum amount of core infarct. Um, initially, when we first started doing the CT perfusions, which was, that was like, probably about 10 years ago is when, at least like at UF, when we first started doing this. Um, you know, there's a lot of suspicion about this and it took a lot of convincing to get um, people on board with this. And so I have talks that I did back there, you know, back at that time, you know, where it shows the CT perfusion and the resulting MRI. And you know, what I can tell you is that the perfusion is remarkably good at predicting final infarct. Um, it's, it's maybe not pixel for pixel, but it's pretty close. And it's certain, from a qualitative standpoint, it's, it's, very, it's very close, which is why, you know, a lot of these people, like, we don't, we don't need MRIs because we have the perfusion study. I know what it's gonna look like. And so, um, you know, so this has been a, a hugely valuable tool now. <laughs> so this is just a modified Rankin square. Again, you don't need to know all the details, but just remember, like, are they walkie-talkie? And if they are, then that's, then that's fine. But if they, if they already have some level of disability, then they're probably not gonna be a candidate. And so, you know, and, and the reason why I like really try and point this out is, you know, I'll get this, I get these transfer calls and it'd be like, you know, we have this 90-year-old patient that has stage four, you know, melanoma, and you know, they, they almost coded yesterday, but we wanna transfer them so you can do endovascular therapy on them, and it's like, it, that isn't gonna work out. Um, and uh, so that's why it's just, it's important to know that there are real criteria for this. It's not me just kind of making it up. So um, again, you know, we make the, the, pay, the selection now is really, you gotta think physiology and not time. Because in re what happens is, is the reason why you have time is because of collateral circulation. So if you have no collateral circulation, you're, you will have an infarction in a very small amount of time. So the brain requires an absolutely constant supply of blood flow to survive and to function. Absolutely constant. Like it can't, you can't shut off the blood flow and still have function, you know, for any amount of time more than like a second or two. And so, and then as soon as you, you know, stop all the blood flow, that brain tissue starts to die very quickly. So you could come to the hospital like within 10 minutes of this happening, we give you TPA, you know, in another 10 or 15 minutes, and you could still have, you know, an infarct because uh, you have no collateral circulation. So that's relatively uncommon. Most people have some degree of collateral circulation, and so, and, and, but it's all over the place. There are some people that have such great collaterals, they'll, you know, you'll, you'll run across these people, they occluded their carotid artery, never knew it happened, right? Because they got a, you know, intact circle of Willis, they have great collaterals. You know, you shut down a carotid, no big deal. There are people who shut down both carotids, never knew it. Um, but again, it's, there's that huge variability in the amount of collateral circulation you have. So, you know, most people are somewhere in the middle, you have some amount of time to go in there and restore blood flow. But instead of guessing now, that's what we use the perfusion for. We don't have to guess anymore. We're doing something that is, you know, fairly quantitative and we can say, yes, this tissue is salvageable, or no, it's not. Um, this is just another sort of example of what these things look like. You get these nice color-coded maps. 
Um, I like these because it gets tired of looking at black and white pictures. Now we finally get color. Uh, and so there, there still is certainly a, an art to reading these things. Um, people who don't, um, don't do this are going to have trouble interpreting these things um, because you have to kind of calibrate your eye to, you know, what, you know, is, you know, what, what does salvageable tissue look like? Make sure, you know, it, it goes in the right pattern, it corresponds to a blood vessel. Because sometimes these, you know, sometimes these tests don't come out perfectly because, you know, the patient's squirming on the table and, you know, the images aren't that great. So there's a little bit of art to reading these things, but it's certainly, certainly very doable. Um, this is just a picture that sort of illustrates the growth and impart volume over time, you know, where, you know, you may, if, you're, if you intervene very early, you know, you might, uh, you might catch it at this, at this stage where there's just this basal ganglia is out, but if you, don't, if you don't intervene, then, you know, you're going to end up losing the whole territory. Um, another uh, baby picture here. Um, Dr. Leffler has, uh, his phone is full of these things. He's, he's all these little children that he delivers. It's um, really great. Sometimes, you know, typically to give you a sense of what these, usually they're some, they're like the size of like a fat grain of rice. That's usually kind of about what they look like. Sometimes they're like, it's like longer than a grain of rice, but that's sort of roughly what you're talking about most of the time. But sometimes they're really big. Um, so any questions on that? Does that all kind of make sense? So. Yes, there's criteria, and no, I didn't make them up. Yeah. Um, did you um, use the band on the screen tool as a guide um, for detecting um, LDOs and sense of um, phosphine and the vector? Do I use what? The band score? The band no. Tool? I mean, there's, there's, I don't even know if I know what that one is, but there's, there's a button. Bu yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of different versions of it, and they're like that race score, and there's there's a bunch of similar ones, and they have like five or six different names, which I guess that's another name for it. Um, but you know, most of these things are really for people who don't really understand what's going on. So you're giving you're giving people this sort of structured tool where you don't have to know the details; you can just look and see. Um, you know that, but you know, when you've been doing this for a while, it's it's. It generally it's pretty obvious like you don't you don't have to like get out your thing and calculate it you know you just know what it is right um, you know you can tell the difference between a zebra and a horse you don't you don't have to like count the stripes right you know it's just so but yeah I mean there's a variety of scale and if you know if people like find it useful like great go for it I mean that's that's yeah, fine perspective yeah exactly I mean you know really you know what I you can even kind of go simpler than that. And so, you know, these patients are almost always going to have unilater you know, unilateral weakness plus some cortical deficit. So if you have somebody that's like weak on the right side and they have aphasia, you know, there you go. Or they're weak on the left side and they have neglect. And so even if you just, you break it down like that simply, because that's basically like what the race score is. is like, you know, are you weak plus you have a cortical thing. And so, that's really all you need to say that, yeah, this person's a potential, you know, endovascular candidate. So you don't have to make it super complicated. Any other questions? All right, I'll keep talking. So, um, so for one thing that comes up a lot is this whole like blood pressure issue. Um, for some reason, like we all kind of collectively have gotten into this habit that we're like obsessively treat people with blood pressure. But, and you know, most of the time you can get away with that, but you, you have to be careful when it comes to, uh, you know, stuff in the brain, particularly stroke. So in particular, people that have not been revascularized through some, you know, manner, um, most of the time what we're gonna do is let their blood pressure kind of do what it wants. Because the thing is, is that the brain is really good at getting the blood pressure it needs. So it controls the thermostat, right? So if it needs more blood, it's gonna turn it up and try and, it'll jack up your blood pressure and try and get more. And if you go and do you know, the opposite of that and you put them on a blood pressure drug, you may cause you know, ischemia. And we see this you know, routinely, people will get admitted, the blood pressure's 180. We have this idea that we, have to, we must make this 120 for some reason. And they get you know, a big dose of labetalol, they drop the pressure, and then now they're plegic on one side. 
happens all the time. Um, and so, but you, you have to remember is that this, you know, these, you know, tissue at risk is being supplied by collaterals most of the time. These vessels are already maximally dilated. And then in that case, blood flow depends upon pressure. And so if you lower the blood pressure too much, you know, you're, you can make somebody have a stroke. Um, so unless there, you know, unless there's some compelling reason to treat the blood pressure, just leave it alone. Don't do anything. And, you know, nothing's going to happen. You know, and, and the thing is, is that we're not saying to do it that way forever. It's just like for the first 24 hours, you know, because typically what's going to happen is whatever, in that amount of time, whatever's going to happen happens. And by the, by the time you get to the next day, either the tissue's alive or it's dead and that's it. Then you can start gradually normalizing the blood pressure. But at first day, just leave it alone. Now, if the person, like, let's say they're having a aortic dissection at the same time and you have to treat, then go ahead. Like, if you have a compelling reason to treat that blood pressure, then you, you can do it. Just, you know, you're doing it with the knowledge you could potentially make it worse and be careful about it. Um, but, you know, if there's no reason, you know, then just leave it alone. Now, the times when you really do need to control the blood pressure is that the patient got TPA, you know, there's a hard limit, systolic blood pressure 180, um, you know, use that and don't, you know, just keep them, but the, here's the thing, it means we'll, when we say keep it less than 180, that's what we mean, it's just less than 180, we don't mean like 110. So, you know, just give them a little bit to get them under 180 and if they're 170, that's fine, that's good, perfect. But, we, you know, you don't wanna make it 90. Um, that, that's, that, that's when people get into trouble. Um, if people, the, normally what we'll do, like if let's say somebody gets endovascular treatment and they were successfully revascularized, at that point you should be able to treat the blood pressure and just kind of normalize it. Because at that point, physiologically, there really shouldn't be any reason that they need extra blood pressure because blood flow has been restored. So that, that part's okay. Um, but so, um, and you know, but you know, sometimes they don't get completely revascularized, so we kind of go somewhere, we sort of treat them like a post-TPA patient, just like not super high. Um, but most of this is just kind of common sense and there's no real magic to it. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about the, you know, the diagnostic evaluation, initial treatment plan. So one thing that, that seems to escape a lot of people is like, why do we admit people to the hospital when they have a stroke? And it seems like a lot of people think it's just to get an MRI. Like that's the whole purpose, you just get that MRI and then you kick them out the door as fast as you can. But that's not really it. So uh, everything I'm gonna talk about here comes out of these guidelines. So none of this stuff is like stuff that I'm making up. This is all just stuff straight out of the guidelines. And this is what we do. Like, you know, what we try to do here is, you know, we follow the guidelines and, you know, we do the stuff that's here. It's not, not just kind of making it up as I, as I go along. Although most people think I am, but. So, so the point, the reason why we admit people to the hospital and like really what the point behind doing all this stuff is to understand what happened. And so we want to determine the etiology because you're not really gonna be able to prevent the next stroke very well if you don't understand what's going on or why this happened. So that's, that's really kind of one of the most important things is determine why this happened. And, and a lot of that is identifying what their, what their risk factors are. So what people tell me all the time is, I have to do this because this is, this is the, the quote unquote stroke workup. So, there is no sort of one stroke workup. There, there's, it, that doesn't exist. That's, that's something that exists only in your imagination. So the, the, you, what, you're, what you do need to do is do a diagnostic evaluation that's tailored to their specific situation and risk factors. So you need to you know, do enough that you understand what's going on and that may be different in different, in different people. So, you know, a common thing we'll see is someone will come in with a cerebellar stroke and, and people will insist and argue with me, no, they have to get a carotid ultrasound. It's like, well, you know, the carotid artery isn't connected to the cerebellum. So it doesn't really matter what's going on in there. It's not relevant to what it is. And there's no rule that says that you have to get a carotid ultrasound. You know, that, that, that doesn't exist. Um, and so, 
you know, and, it, and if you, you know, or, or a lot of times you'll even see like, you know, for example, the radiologist will order a CTA, the head and neck, and the report will just say no carotid disease. Well, it's like, well, that's nice and all, but, you know, the patient has a cerebellar stroke and, you know, you didn't even comment on the vertebral arteries and, well, you know, one of those vertebral arteries is occluded and, or he's got dissection in it. And then, so it would have been great if you had sort of looked at it and mentioned that. Um, so, you know, there's not just one thing. You, you need to look at the patient. And, and if, if all else fails, you could take a history, right, and see, see what's going on. Um, and so, uh, but, and this is all stuff that's gonna, you know, come out of the guys. So what they say about diabetes screening is, they don't say much, they just basically say you should do it. So um, definitely uh, would check a hemoglobin A1C. Um, that's actually like a thing that gets missed a lot. But it's super helpful for me because the people that tend to be, be repeat customers very often, they're diabetics. And so, you know, if they came in two years ago and their A1C is 14 and they come in, you know, tomorrow and their A1C is 14, that's really helpful. It, like, it, it really cuts out the mystery, right? Like, we know why they had another stroke. So, you know, on the other hand, you know, if they came, you know, they cut, it was 14 and now it's six, well, now I maybe I need to look to, you know, look a little deeper, do something different. But that's, it's really, it's very helpful for the repeat customers. And we have a few of those. So um, for hyperlipidemia screening, so this is one of these core measures um, that you're gonna wanna be aware of. Uh, essentially what they say is, you know, you should you know, you either check a lipid panel and make a treatment decision based on the lipid panel or you put them on a statin. And now it's gotten a little bit more, a little wrinkle, which is now what they want you to do is to start a high intensity statin, um, and with, which does have a specific definition, which is a torvastatin 80 or resuvastatin 40. Um, and so this is what now the, you know, the official guidelines uh, say if uh, and that's if they have a LDL greater than than 70 um, There still seems to be a little bit of debate about whether it's going to be hundred or 70 But it looks to me the way I kind of read this is that 70 is going to be the number if not now pretty soon so you might as well just use 70 if You know if they are intolerant to high dose therapy Then you can put them on moderate intensity therapy, which is the lower dose that are listed here or you document why you don't do it. And with all of these core measures, it's the, the, the rule is always you either do it or you just document why not. It's, it's not that you have to like put the 98 year old lady on 80 of a torvastatin. You know, you can, you can not do it, but you just have to write down why you didn't do it so it doesn't look like an oversight, essentially. Yep. The, the LDL is less than 70, would you not start stat, start statting Right, so, and that's an excellent point. So what, what, and the problem is here is using a lipid panel to make the choice. So they're kind of schizophrenic about this. So what the data shows, just like you said, is that there's really not a good correlation between your lipid panel and whether you benefit from a statin. Like th there is a strong relationship in coronary artery disease, so everybody assumed that's how it would work in stroke, but what all the studies like have sort of collectively led to is that that relationship isn't really there. And that people even that have good numbers, they still get the benefit. And so, so that really kind of begs the question is, well, so why are we still making this determination by a lipid panel and why are we even checking it? I think what's going on is they're just not ready to give up on the lipid panel. You know, they, everybody kind of knows it's worthless, but they just, they can't let it go. It's like their warm fuzzy blanket. So they're still holding on to this, but you, you make a very good point. So if the person, if I believe the patient has atherosclerotic disease or they're diabetic or that kind of stuff, yeah, I'm probably gonna put them on a statin anyways. If it's like, let's say 80 year old lady who just has AFib and her vessels are as clean as can be and her LDL is 40, I mean, is that person really gonna benefit? 
Eh, probably not. Really, I mean, what they need is anticoagulation so they don't have another cardioembolism. So, you, you know, you can make a good case to skip it in that case, but if they're diabetic or if they have, you know, any atherosclerotic disease, uh, that's a good case to treat it, even if it's a LDL 68, you know. So, brain imaging also is another one of these sort of contentious issues. So, what the guidelines say is, for prevention of recurrent stroke, the use of MRI is reasonable in some patients to provide additional information to guide selection, right? So, it does not say that every single person with a stroke needs an MRI. Um, this is, again, common misconception. So, in, in most cases, you know, you don't need an MRI to diagnose a stroke, right? I mean, there are just accurate descriptions of stroke going back to the ancient Greeks. So 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, people were diagnosing strokes accurately based on a clinical history, and I'm pretty sure they didn't have MRI scanners back then. So, so that isn't really the point. So where the, the, the time when you should get an MRI is, you know, they're kind of, you know, the presentation's kind of weird, I'm not totally sure what I'm dealing with, or I, you know, maybe, like, I, or it's a situation where I don't really have any idea why they had the stroke, and so looking at the pattern of the infarction will give you some uh, information on what the source is. So example of that, you know, someone mostly looks like they had a, you know, a distal left MCA stroke, but, you know, they have some funny symptom that's on the other side. Well, you get an MRI at that point, and then you see, well, yeah, they got, you know, yeah, they have a bigger infarct in the left hemisphere, but there's a couple of little tiny ones in the right hemisphere. Then that tells you they had a proximal embolic source, and it guides you as to where to look for the etiology. So <coughs> I'm not saying not to get them ever. It's just we should look at it as a you know, look at it rationally as a tool to you know help us work through um, the etiology and not just automatically assume that you always need it. Um, and because lots of times you don't need it. I mean, especially these people who come in, like, you know, they get a perfusion study and stuff. Like, we know what's going on. There's no mystery there. So, um, so they, they, you know, even in the guidelines, so, you know, you don't have to necessarily feel like you absolutely have to do this. I mean, this is what is in the guidelines. This is the official standard of care. All right. Cervical vascular imaging. So this, again, is the carotid ultrasound. And so they also specifically address this. So they say, for patients with a non-disabling stroke in the carotid territory who may be a candidate for CEA or stenting, you should look at those people with some sort of imaging. That makes sense, right? But if you have a patient where there is no way that they're a candidate for an endarterectomy, then you don't need to do a carotid ultrasound. There's no point to it. It, there's no sort of official box that you are ticking off that, that you know, c requires you to do this. You know, do it if it makes sense. Do it if there's some possibility that they might get a treatment for that. Or it, even if you're just, you know, you really need to just add that as part of identifying the etiology, that's fine. But if there's no way that they're going to get a surgery, then you could skip it. So, also, the corollary to this is that, you know, the recommendation is that, you know, if you find somebody that has symptomatic carotid disease, the time to treat them is between 48 hours and seven days. It's not six weeks, it's not six months. Um, this idea that you need to let the stroke cool down is just nonsense that's not supported by, you know, the evidence. That's something that dates back 50 years, you know, before they invented science. So, you know, right now, this is the thing, and the reason for this is that if you have a symptomatic carotid lesion, the time when you are most likely to have another stroke is in that first seven days. So, if you can go six weeks without having a recurrent stroke, then you probably don't need the CEA because at some point not long after that, your risk drops back down to the baseline risk. So, you know, so if you wait six weeks, it basically means you don't really need the procedure. Now, it's great for padding your surgical numbers because your, your, you know, your perioperative stroke risk is gonna be really low because all the people that were gonna have the stroke already had them. 
And so only the safe, stable people are gonna get treated, but that's really kind of backwards, right? We're, we're trying to treat the people, the whole point of doing a CEA is to prevent the big one, not wait for the big one to happen and do it afterwards. So, so that's the idea behind that. Does that make sense? Uh, intracranial vascular imaging, again, it's, this is, you know, if it makes sense, you know, you do it. Um, most of the time, you know, if you're gonna, like, a lot of one thing I see kind of a lot is somebody order a CTA of the neck, but not the head and neck. And, you know, that, that's kind of helpful, but here's the thing, it's like, well, what if the problem isn't in the neck? You know, you, you didn't answer the question. So, in most cases, you, you're always gonna wanna order a head and neck. And the only time you're going to uh, do, um, you know, just like just the neck is if you really you already know where the pathology is and you you need to check on it, or or you might just like if you like for example the patient has an aneurysm in their brain, then you could just order a head because like the neck doesn't really matter in that case. But if you're doing some sort of stroke workup where you don't know where the pathology is, you're almost always going to do a head and neck. Because sometimes, what if the you know what if they have intracranial stenosis and their their neck is totally fine? You're going to miss that. Cardiac evaluation. Um, again, this is one of those things where uh, you know your your goal is to try and identify the etiology. If you already know the etiology, they don't necessarily need an echo. Um, you know, or for example, like they you know they have AFib. They're in AFib in the ER, and you know. Oh, okay, yeah, we kind of we kind of know what's going on here, but what you know what the guidelines say is you know you should do if you don't know what what's going on you know you should put them on cardiac tally while they're in the hospital and monitor them, and if you know if you think that there's some sort of possibility that they have a cardioembolism then you do an echocardiogram for that, but. Let's say you already know they have a symptomatic carotid and that's where the problem is. Well, then you don't have to do an echo. There's no rule that says you have to do an echo. But if you, if you don't know yet, then yeah, do one. It'll help, it'll help you identify it. All this stuff is really common sense stuff when you, when you look into it. It's not, it's not a bunch of just arbitrary you know, rules. Um, and again, even in the guidelines, they say, you know, Routine echocardiography, meaning you do that for every single person, doesn't seem to help anything, so you don't have to do it. You do it when it makes sense. Um, PFO evaluation, this is another, uh, another one of those interesting topics. Um, so more uh, relatively recently, like in the last two years, there have been these six randomized controlled trials that they're all kind of different. Uh, and they evaluated mechanical closure devices, uh, and they, they quote unquote showed a benefit. But it's got a couple of asterisks next to it. So one thing is that they had very highly restrictive eligibility criteria. And so if you were going to sort of try and use this information, you have to understand what those criteria were and, and apply them. But, um, you know, and you really, you know, you, the way they got this benefit was to do, you know, a meta-analysis of very different trials and do some fancy statistics and massage that until they got the result they wanted uh, with a number needed to treat of 131. So if you remember back from Dr. Leffler's talk, you know, where endovascular therapy has a number needed to treat of like 2.8. So just to kind of put stuff in perspective here. So when you start looking at the footnotes of what those asterisks mean is what you find is each one of these trials had greater than one uh, methodological feature that you know, was a high risk for bias. You know, that's the sort of polite way to put this. And so you know, essentially what these trials were, you know, they were designed to show a, a benefit to sell the device, essentially. So, you know, you kind of have to take this stuff with a, a grain of salt. Um, the other problem that with the whole PFO issue is none of the trials have yet, um, have really sort of identified whether, is it the PFO that causes the stroke or is it the venous thrombus? 
and that's that's an important question because if you know if if it's the actual defect between the atrium that is the source of the where the clot forms and where that's why they they form you know have the event in the first place well yeah that that provides better evidence that or you know, reason that like if you fix that you're going to fix something for the patient but if it is just a totally passive participant, it's just a door that allows the clot to cross over from the left to the right side. Well, if you close it, like there, then they just the clot's going to go into the you know the right through the stay in the right atrium and go into their lung, and then they have a big PE and they die. So, what did you accomplish by closing it? And you know, and if if the patient has to stay on anticoagulation, whether you close it or not, then what additional benefit do you gain by closing it? When, and the thing to keep in mind is that one of the primary risks of the procedure itself is stroke, and also, you know, there's also a significant risk of causing atrial fibrillation from doing the procedure, which is a, another risk for stroke, which would mean you have to anticoagulate them anyways. So, that's where the kind of the problems are with this, is it's, it is a solution really in search of a problem. And it's, they, they really haven't shown a, a, a rational basis yet for mechanically closing these things in a sort of like in a general sense. You know, I mean, there may be individual cases where that makes sense, but to sort of like do this routinely across the board um, is still really very problematic. The other, the other problem with it is it pays really well. So, what I tell people is a PFO is a hole that, that cardiologists find money in. And that's you know, mainly what it is. And if you want to apply some sort of rational decision making, you, know, you really kind of have to understand the whole thing, understand what these, like the inclusion criteria and what this was. Because basically, if you do just like a bad job working the patient up, then every stroke is going to be a cryptogenic stroke, right? And it's like, well, that's because you didn't do the workup. And so that's the, that's the problem, is that yes, there are these things that are cryptogenic strokes that happen in young people and stuff like that, but when you actually look at these papers, what you find is that almost always the situation is they just didn't do the workup so they could sell more of these devices and they made it look like you know, it's going to do something. All right, enough of my soapbox. Um, so one thing, you know, this is kind of, like, I don't know, something I find interesting because most of the time the information isn't presented this way. It's just sort of like presented as this big jumble and like with lots of different, you know, uh, pathophysiology and disease process and stuff. They just kind of throw it all into one bucket and then they hand you this mixed up bucket and they want you to kind of somehow make sense of that. And, and that just doesn't really work and I think that's why there's so much confusion about this. So if you take a practical approach to ischemic stroke, you really can break this down into like three different categories. And these are, you can really think of these almost as three different disease processes. And they, they're not, you know, they're not the same thing and they have some differences. And if you, if you just kind of look at it this way, I think it'll make a lot more, a lot more sense and you'll understand like why we do some of the things we do. So the categories are small vessel disease, large vessel disease, and proximal embolic sources. So we start with small vessel disease. So this, you know, this is a process where um, because of, you know, the typical risk factors of this is going to be hypertension, diabetes, smoking, and age. And, you know, what happens is it leads to what's called lipohyalinosis where the blood vessel is trying to respond to the damage caused by these things. And it does so by like, you could think of it as like they're reinforcing the wall of that little blood vessel. And as that continues to happen, eventually the lumen closes off. And so this isn't really like, this isn't really a disease that's like synonymous with plavix deficiency, right? Because it's not really driven by thrombosis, it, not in any kind of real simple sense. It, it is, uh, it, it's, it's really driven by damage to the endothelium and the, the blood vessel actually changing and eventually shutting down. And so, you know, it, it happens in this sort of progression. So, you, you know, the 
you know, when the person's in their 50s say, you know, they got a few spots here and there, and then, you know, a decade later it's worse, and then, you know, by the time they're 70, you know, it looks, looks bad, like the, you know, the image all the way on the, on the, you know, right side. So, um, you know, and then that progression may not necessarily be obviously symptomatic in the sense that something dramatic happens, but there may be punctuated events where, you know, some damage happens in a particular place that is obviously symptomatic, and then we call it a stroke. <coughs> you know, but when this happens like slowly over time, you know, eventually you end up with vascular dementia. And, you know, so that in that sense, whether you're symptomatic or not really just depends on how well you look. Um, if you just wave at the patient from the doorway, yeah, you may not pick up on some subtle cognitive stuff, but, you know, it may still be there. So these are the big ones. I mean, this pretty much sums up most of our patients, right? Hypertension, diabetes, you know, plus or minus smoking, right? You know, no teeth, you know, typical Tampa patient. So you're going to see a lot of this, and this is, this is super common. In our patient population, we see a lot more small vessel disease than large vessel disease. So everybody's all focused on this carotid ultrasound and doing this stuff, but if, if that's your focus, you're really, you're gonna miss most of the pathology in our, our patients because we actually don't see very much. I mean, it's kind of interesting that, that that's the skew, you know, in our particular population, but, you know, for, it's, it's gotta be at least like three to one. Um, so, you know, it's helpful to understand what common presentations of these disorders are. So, you know, typically you're gonna see like a face, arm, and leg motor or sensory deficit. So if you see that pattern where it's face, arm, and leg, and they're not aphasic or they don't have neglect, then that's, it's probably a small vessel stroke. And these are super common. There's interesting anatomic explanation for why this is the case. If, if anybody's interested, I can bore you with those details. But in any case, it's like, this is just super common. You'll see it all the time. Now, the other interesting thing about this is that if you, if you look at MRIs and you take like 10 people that all have the same stroke, same volume of the infarct, there's actually this wildly variant different degree of severity and weakness. Uh, why that is, I have no idea, but it's just one of those things that's, that's weird. These are also the kind of people that will present with these sort of stuttering type of symptoms. You know, they'll come into the ER and because they got weakness, and then they quote unquote get better, you know, while they're in the ER, and then you, you know, and then you, they get, you know, blown off, and then half an hour later it's back again, and then, you know, everybody rushes around and does stuff. So this is, this is fairly common, you know, where it'll have this sort of stuttering course, and you just kind of have to understand that so you know to expect it. And also, it, it is very helpful to explain this to patients and their families. So this will save you a lot of trouble. So I've been burned by this on many of occasion, where the person comes in, you know, they had transient weakness, now they're totally normal, you know, and they're, they're trying to have one of these anterior choroidal strokes, which is what I'm talking about, and then eight hours go by and it comes back. And so if you, you know, if you explain this ahead of time, you're much less likely to, you know, uh, get burned by this. And so I, I try to remember to sort of explain that to people that, you know, it may stutter along. Now, the problem is, uh, from a treatment standpoint, is, well, what do you do with that situation? Um, there's, not really, there's not really any treatment that's been found to interrupt this process. Um, you, know, you know, you might say, well, why don't you just give them TPA? Well, you know, like let's say it comes back eight hours from the time they came. Well, where do, which, which time do you use as your last known well time? Well, I mean, isn't it eight hours ago? You know, so it gets hard. And, and even in this case, it's like, well, if you have this vessel that just closed down and it's not really due to thrombosis, like is TPA really gonna do anything? So it's hard, um, and, but unfortunately, there's not really a defined recipe for what to do about this. And you're gonna see this and it's gonna happen and you're gonna get angry people yelling at you and you know, but just to be aware of this. Um, 
Again, if this kind of gets progressively you know, uh, worse over time, then you eventually you get what we call vascular dementia. And that's, you know, I call this brain rot. You know, it's just basically your, you've, your white matter, you've just destroyed so much of it that it has now reached the point where it's the symptoms are so obvious that like a surgeon could find them, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, and believe it or not, we are now like fairly commonly seeing uh, patients in their 40s coming in with small vessel disease. So just uh, earlier this week, um, or maybe it was Friday or something, we had a lady who's like 47, 45, and you know, didn't obviously look like she had a lot of problems. I mean, turns out she's had untreated high blood pressure for like 20 years, but like when you look at her, you're not like, oh, this is a really sick person. She looked okay, and she kind of had this funny presentation, and but, and I was like, well, I, I, best I can tell you're having a stroke, so we're gonna treat you. And so we did, and you know, luckily I did treat her because yeah, sure enough, she did have a stroke. And you know, but she was like 45, and really her only risk factor was untreated hypertension. And so, you know, you, although you typically think of this as something that's gonna come back to bite you when you're like in your 60s or 70s, it's happening in the 30s or in the 40s. And like even the people that are like, now you're seeing like in the people that are really obese from a young age, now we're seeing, we're, they're, they're having these strokes like in their late 30s or for early 40s. And so, yeah, and you know, and a lot of times they get blown off because it's like, oh, you must be faking it. And, but it's happening. And then and you look at their brains sometimes and you know, their brains will look like, you know, somebody who's, you know, a couple decades ago would have been like the 60s to 70s population. So. It's, um, it's really the age is, is, is creeping down. <coughs> so the, the, the treatment plan for small vessel disease, I think this is, the, this is one of the, the biggest problems that we face is people don't understand this fact. So the treatment is risk factor modification and risk factor modification and also risk factor modification. So the treatment is not aspirin or Plavix. That's the little cherry on top of the sundae. Like that's a little extra benefit you do to give them the most thing. But if you were gonna do just one thing, it's like just treat their blood pressure, right? If they're like a difficult patient, they don't wanna go to the doctor, and you can only get, like I can only focus on one thing, just treat the blood pressure, you know, if that's the risk factor, or treat the diabetes. And don't worry about like whether you give them aspirin or Plavix, it really doesn't matter because when you look at the absolute risk reduction from all of these fancy drugs, it's really tiny in comparison to risk factor modification. And the reason why people keep coming back with recurrent strokes when they're on aspirin and Plavix and whatever else expensive antiplatelet drug you wanna come up with, it's because nobody treated the risk factors. So the blood pressure's still 250, that's why they had another stroke. It's not because they, they need Berlinta now, you know. But you know, the problem is the reason why we get all focused on that is because that's what the drug companies want is they they want to sell a drug to everybody that they can stay on for the rest of their life so they've really pushed this whole idea of like it's all about antiplatelet drugs you know plavix is like one of the best selling drugs in history generated bazillion dollars i think they had to invent new words for like how big the profit margins were on these things so you know but that's not really how you treat this problem it's really about treating the risk factors and so that, that's really what we, you know, we need to do is identify what those risk factors, at least get them started on it. I don't care, you wanna put them on 325 or 162 or 25 aspirin, it doesn't matter, really. As far as aspirin goes, actually, in Europe they use 50 milligrams, 50 seems to be enough. Doesn't, you know, results don't get better with more aspirin, so. Any questions on that? It's pretty simple, it's just treat the risk factors. But that's the thing that almost never gets done. And, it, and you know, the thing is, this is actually really hard. So, it, it, you know, people think, it's, oh, I'll just give you an antihypertensive, right? So when I, was a, when I was a fellow, we were part of the Sampras trial, which was, is, they did something really unique. So Sampras was a, uh, a trial where they looked at stenting versus, uh, like stenting plus medical management versus medical management alone. But the unique thing that they did in this trial is they actually defined what medical management was. So almost every trial of medical management is total BS. It is garbage science. Because when you look at it, what they say is medical management is just, well, whatever people want to do, right? 
So you do a study where you compare something to just whatever. It's like, well, what do you, com you know, you're not doing any, that's not science, that's, that's just, you know, it's nothing. So what they did is they, um, they actually defined exactly what medical management was. So they had these targets where they said, you know, your blood pressure, you know, you had to meet this goal at this time, blah, 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 like very detailed. And they, they actually, part of this trial, they had this company that helped manage all this stuff, manage the data, and like would call the patient, like, you know, it, uh, it, day seven, you know, you call the patient, you say, okay, well, what's your blood pressure, blah, blah, blah. And where they really actually looked, and what, and then if they, like, if their blood pressure was high, then they had to come to clinic, and we would check it and do all this stuff, right? So it was super labor intensive. And what you found, what we found out is that if you actually want to do medical management right, it's actually really hard, and it's very labor intensive. Just treating people's like blood pressure was like, took like 20 visits, I mean, it was hard. It wasn't like, you know, you just give them some metopolol and send them out the door. So, I don't wanna minimize like how challenging it is, but, but that's really where the focus needs to be, and, it, and it's much harder than you think it is. If you actually check the results of what you do, uh, like on an ongoing basis in an outpatient setting, it, it's challenging. So, all right, large vessel disease. So this is, um, you know, this is like the, the more, uh, I don't know, maybe the stuff that everybody, you know, typically thinks of, you know, carotid artery stenosis, this kind of stuff. Um, and so, you know, the, the risk factors are, you know, they're actually kind of the same, but, you know, they actually produce sort of this, you know, very kind of different uh, clinical uh, type of uh, things that you see. So, you know, we I kind of break this down into uh, three categories just based on practical, uh, the way you deal with them, right? So, the first one is either intracranial, cervical, or uh, aortic atheromatous disease. You know, this is hypertension, diabetes, smoking, and this is the, the what people, you know, typically think of. And you're gonna, you know, again, you're gonna treat this sort of similar to the way you treat small vessel disease in the sense that it's very risk factor oriented. Um, but then you also have things like dissections. And dissections aren't really, they're not really due to those typical risk factors. They don't have anything to do with it. Um, the typical kind of patient that you're gonna see with a dissection is like a young, otherwise healthy patient and it just sort of happens. Like that's kind of the most common way. Um, presumably this is due to some sort of anatomic defect um, in, you know, in the wall, the blood vessel that eventually kind of gives out and then they have this, right? Everybody like really focuses on trauma and they're like, oh, you know, I, I, I bumped my head when I was in sixth grade and that must be, what, no, like, that's not it. So it does happen with trauma. That's the vast minority of cases. At our hospital where we're not a level one trauma center, you're probably very rarely ever gonna see a tr something that's clearly related to trauma. Um, but so, so you can kind of like not worry so much about that. Um, and, um, but, but the point here is that it, like, it's not due to like high blood pressure. This is just something that happens. We don't really understand it. Um, you can try and order a, high, you know, a, you know, a connective tissue disease workup, but good luck with that. I mean, it's way more complicated than you think it is. And most of that stuff, you know, you can't like, you can't readily get those labs and stuff like that. So that, that's not really the issue. Um, a third category that's kind of um, important is radiation fibrosis. Um, especially with our proximity to Moffitt, you're gonna see these patients too. This one is sort of its own distinct entity as far as, uh, as, far as treatment goes as well. So, um, so common presentations, you know, it's gonna be like your typical MCA occlusion. And again, this is where you're gonna see the face and, face and um, arm motor or sensory deficit. And then they're probably gonna have some cortical deficit, which is either like language or neglect. Those are the easy ones. Um, or they may just, if it's something smaller, they may just have cortical deficits alone. Like they might just be aphasic. So the treatment plan for this, um, again, you know, is, is mostly the same stuff for the small vessel disease in the sense that if they have diabetes, yeah, you're gonna have to treat all that stuff too. If they have symptomatic carotid stenosis, then uh, CEA is still the first line treatment. Um, that really hasn't changed. There was tons of excitement about stents when they came out, and I think most of that was driven by the fact that now 
you had these other groups of people that were able to do this very profitable procedure that were never had access to it before. So you had everybody and their brother doing carotid stents, like there was this, the guy down the street, the podiatrist, you know, everybody was doing them, right? So, and of course, you know, the outcomes were what you expect with that, right? So, but, and they've done uh, lots of studies comparing, you know, CEA and stents, and basically, what the bottom line is that is that if you really tightly control like who does the stent and all the other factors about it, it's roughly equivalent to CEA and outcome. And you know, there's a little more like heart attacks in the stent group and a little more other stuff in the CEA group, but th that's not really important. The thing to remember about stents is that you know you have to put people on aspirin and plavix for like six months, right? So that's kind of, in a lot of cases, that's problematic. So you have this 80-year-old guy, and you stick him on aspirin and Plavix for six months. Well, what happens if he gets a subdural two weeks from now? Oh, wait, now I gotta stop the aspirin and Plavix, and then his stent's gonna clot off, right? So, you, you know, these are things that you kinda, you know, you have to think about. And, and that's why, you know, CEA is still the preferred treatment, because in the vast majority of the cases, if you do a CEA and you clean it out and it goes well, like you're never gonna need a treatment for that again, like invasive treatment at least, is that it's done. And that you may like, you may get some atheromatous buildup back there, but it's, it's probably not ever gonna get to the point where you need another treatment. I mean, if you just keep smoking, then yeah, it's, it probably is. But the people that actually get appropriately treated, it doesn't come back. Stents, on the other hand, I mean, they like to re that you know, you may have to come back and get it retreated and stuff. So it's not as durable, it's more problematic, Stents are great for people that can't get a CEA for a re certain reason. Like, for example, the, where their bifurcation is is up behind their jaw. So in the old days, they used to disarticulate the jaw and actually go up there and do it. Um, you don't wanna do that, that's, that's a big mess. Um, so normally, that's the kind of person where you're gonna wanna put a stent in that patient um, instead. Um, re uh, the other place where the, stent, where the stent is first line treatment is radiation fibrosis. So those patients you don't wanna do open surgeries on. They have a ton of scar tissue already. You're just gonna create more by trying to do this. If, if you can even find the vessel like in that big mass of scar tissue, you might not be able to. But so those are the people that where like stent is the primary indication for that. Um, dissections on the other hand um, are almost never treated invasively. Um, people somewhere got the idea that like oh, I can put a stent in this vessel, so therefore I must do that. But the, the papers, you know, the stuff where they actually describe the outcomes of trying to stent dissections, you know, I remember one paper that was in a vascular surgery journal where they had a 50% major complication rate and they thought that was a really great outcome. And, you know, if you do nothing except put them on aspirin, you get a way better outcome with that. So. You know, it, this is not something that is treated invasively. The only, the only time when you're, you would really do that would be if there's some sort of weird situation where it's like they've got no flow and if you don't open that vessel, they're gonna die. Like, cause that's their last blood vessel or something. But most of the time what happens is you just stick them on an antiplatelet or an anticoagulant and they're fine. Um, the guidelines say, you know, either one of those is reasonable, treat them for three to six months. There really isn't any good studies that have real, like, or big ones at least, where they compared the thing. Traditional wisdom was they had to be anticoagulated. What few studies that have been done to compare us, I'm sure the treatments are equivalent. So if you want to just stick them on aspirin, that you know seems to be as good as anything else. Um, there are some sort of less common but important like special cases with large vessel disease. You know, if you have a patient with like, you know, what we call string sign, where they have this, you know, very almost occluded carotid, and they're having these like recurrent embolic events, clearly like unstable plaque, that's the, that's the kind of, you know, one of the few situations where you, you know, would maybe put that person on heparin. Um, that's one of the, you know, the few indications for heparin in the, this acute setting. Um, if you, and this is supported by the literature, you know, because if you look at those trials where they did, you know, um, 
looked at heparin in acute stroke, this was one of those subgroups where actually, yeah, it did show a benefit, but across all comers of stroke, it doesn't. But in this sort of one special group, um, you could do, um, you know, you could also do like something like load them with aspirin and Plavix. The only problem with that is that mo most of these people are people where you're going to do a surgery on them, so you probably don't want to load that person with aspirin and Plavix so they can have their CEA tomorrow. Like that, that probably isn't the best thing. Heparin is kind of a good option because you can just turn it off. So if, if they're not a surgical candidate, that's a much better argument to say, you know, I'm going to load them with aspirin and Plavix and, and do that. Um, I, you know, I even have seen or done stuff like put them on one of the IV antiplatelet drugs, you know, for a day or something to try and get that to settle down. Um, but the, these are fairly uncommon, but this is just worth some mention. So proximal embolic sources, so vast majority of these are going to be cardioembolism. You know, the, our typical patient population is, you know, AFib or occult AFib. You know, the incidence of AFib goes up dramatically after age 85. So if you see somebody come in who's 88 years old and is quote unquote healthy and they've got this cardioembola, you know, they have a, a large vessel stroke, you know, if you just guessed that it was due to AFib on all those people, you'd be right almost every time. So, you know, it's really common. So you gotta kinda look at that. Um, and you can also see this in cardiomyopathy patients. Um, and uh, so those are kind of the two main things you're looking for, at least as far as how common they are. Um, one thing that is often missed is aortic arch atheroma. So this is why it's good that when they do the CTA of the head and neck is they actually get the top of the aorta so you can see that. And if you, the radiologists never look at it. Um, but if you look at it, you see, sometimes you'll see like their carotids are clean, but you look at the top of their aorta and it looks, you know, it looks like a war zone. There's like craters everywhere and it's just all nasty. And so that's, that's a place where they may have a proximal embolism source, but, and it has nothing to do with AFib. So, you know, in that case, that's atheromatous disease. You're going to treat it just like atheromatous disease anywhere else. And that you don't necessarily have to anticoagulate that person. <laughs> Um, there is such a thing as paradoxical embolism where, you know, you have some sort of clot or something that forms on the venous side, ends up in the arterial side. It's rare. Um, it's the kind of thing that maybe once a year I see, maybe not. Um, it's, 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 you know, you're not going to see a lot of it. Hypercoagulable states, you know, they exist too. Um, probably most of the people out there that have been diagnosed with a hypercoagulable state, you know, it probably doesn't apply to them having a stroke. The vast majority of those conditions are venous clotting disorders. And so, you know, they don't really, there's not really very much evidence that venous clotting disorders are associated with stroke at all. Um, but you'll get, sometimes you'll see these people, you know, they're like 26 and they'll come in, they had a big stroke and you're like, no clue where it came from and I can't find anything. Um, so, and you know, so they do exist, but my, I, my guess is, is probably they, almost all of them have not been defined. So, um, you know, you can, you know, you can send like all this blood work that costs a fortune and almost all of it's gonna be totally useless. Um, and because we, we just don't have a test for these arterial clotting disorders. And so, um, and you know what, you're gonna anticoagulate all these people anyway, so it really doesn't matter. Um, so for a, a question that I get all the time is somebody's got AFib, when do you start anticoagulation? So, um, you know, the answer, you know, is probably going to be the same all the time too, which is, you know, if they have a small or almost, you know, non-existent stroke, you could start it immediately. They're not going to bleed. But, you know, if they've got a pretty good sized stroke, you know, you probably need to delay it unless you absolutely have to for some reason. And the delay is, you know, 10 to 14 days. Why that? because that's how they did the trials for these drugs. And so we, we have data on that plan. And you could say, well, what about seven days? Well, it might work, but we just don't have, we don't have the data, so maybe it's higher risk, I don't know. And unfortunately, we're never gonna get that data because in order to do that, we would have to like make a trial where we said, we're gonna do something that we think is dangerous, but we're not really sure. Will you sign up for this trial? So it's never gonna happen. So that's, this is, that's the reason why we do it. It's just because that's the best data we got and you know, it seems to work. 
Um, you will, if people get started immediately, like on heparin or something, and they have big stroke, you will see people with symptomatic hemorrhages. It happens, you know, uh, and so, you know, delaying it by some amount of time seems to work, but what that magic number is, don't know. Um, so um, a, a lot of people get like super nervous about the fact that, oh my God, they got AFib, I have to treat them immediately. Well, we don't actually, because the way the statistics work out is the risk of having an early recurrent stroke, like let's say three days later, is, is really low. You know, it does happen, but, it, but it's a very small number. And if you compare that risk to the number of people that get harmed by the heparin, well, way more people get harmed by the heparin than have an early recurrent stroke. And that's, you know, a bunch of trials have shown this. And this stuff was done in the 80s, and it's all in cardi cardiology journals. So this isn't like anything new. So, um, so really, the, the, this is still, you know, the way you should do it. Now, the exceptions to this would be like, let's say you've got somebody and they've got some big LV thrombus that's like waving around every time that they, uh, you know, have a heartbeat. Yeah, that person, that person's probably at much higher risk for early recurrent stroke, and that person I'd probably just bite the bullet and put them on immediate anticoagulation. But in the absence of some sort of scenario like that, just, just wait, you know, 10 days or something and, and, and do it at that point, and it'll work out okay. Uh, another thing about anticoagulation that comes up all the time is, well, what if they, what if they fall? Well, as it turns out, People have studied this too. In fact, there's this trial called Use of Anticoagulation in Patients Who Are at Risk for Falls. So they actually specifically exactly looked at that question. And what that shows is they're still, you know, long term, they're still better off getting anticoagulated than, than not because, you know, if your chance of having, you know, a fatal intracranial bleeding complication versus your chance of having, you know, a stroke from AFib. Because here's the thing, like, you know, most of the time when you have a cardioembolism, like from AFib, it's the big one. It's the last thing that happens to you. You're, you know, your life is never the same afterwards. It's a big stroke, it's totally disabling. So that's the thing, and it's like, if you had some like, you know, we get all worked up about the fact that somebody has like this little tiny subdural that's like maybe even asymptomatic. It's like, well, if you have that compared to having the big one, you know, eh. so. The other, the other thing to keep in mind is that with these new drugs as opposed to warfarin, these new drugs are way better behaved than warfarin. So we used to see people like, you know, with uh, anticoagulant related intracranial hemorrhage like every day. You'd be like getting three or four of them every day. And now you don't hardly see any. I mean, there are people, yeah, they fall and they, they really whack their head and they, yeah, they get a subdural and stuff, you know, so it happens, but it's not like you're seeing like three a day like it was with in the Coumadin era. And, um, and even, you know, even when people have like, let's say they have a, you know, they, they have a little hypertensive bleed and they're on Eliquis, actually what happens is they look the same as the people who don't on Eliquis. They don't seem to bleed anymore and, you know, so they're, they're remarkably well behaved compared to, compared to warfarin. Um, again, aortic arch atheroma, I just would treat this the same way you treat atheroma's disease in general. Um, any questions on that so far? All right, I'll keep going. I'll keep talking faster, maybe we can get out of here, okay? All right, so management of complications. Um, you know, this, the outcome is, you know, of what happens after you have a stroke, you know, depends on the type of stroke you have, the nature of this, and mostly, you know, in large part depends on location. You know, you can have a tiny infarct, you know, in your, you know, medulla that can be really disabling, or you can have a tiny infarct in your right frontal lobe and not even know it. So location is super important. But in terms of mortal uh, outcome in the sense of like mortality, it's really due to early medical interventions and prevention of complications. So this is um, a slide. You don't need to really know the numbers or the important, but essentially what this is, is this is time on the bottom. This is 1950, this is 1994, um, and this is uh, mortality from stroke. Um, this isn't Canadians. I'm pretty sure Canadians have a similar physiology to us, so it's probably still applicable. But basically, you know, you can see that this is a big line going down. And so remember, this is 1950. So this isn't TPA. This isn't fancy endovascular treatment. What this is, this is actually good nursing care. 
That's, that's what caused this. So you're, you're doing dysphagia screening, so people aren't getting you know, the, the amount of uh, aspiration pneumonia that they used to. Because it used to be the number one cause of death after stroke was aspiration pneumonia. So you would have all these people like, you know, by day seven they were all dead because they, they all got pneumonia. I don't even, did they even have ventilators in 1950? I don't think so. But you know what I mean? So, but really what this all, there's, there's nothing like fancy. This is just like what we consider good nursing care today. That's what's responsible for all this stuff. And that's what, you know, that's really important that we get that part right because, you know, if the person, you know, it's all well and good that you like did this fancy treatment with your catheter, but they die four days later because they had a PE or, you know, get a pneumonia, like it, it doesn't really help much. So that's why dysphagia screening is, again, it's one of these core measures um, and it, it's really important for surviving, you know, surviving the stroke in the first place. As far as the core measure works, you know, what, the, what it says is every, every patient needs to be screened for dysphagia. So this can be accomplished in a variety of ways. It does not mean that every single person has to be MPO until speech therapy sees the patient. So it can be something as simple as the admitting physician says they don't have any dysphagia, right? So if, like, like say somebody comes in and their only symptom is they have some arm numbness, okay? That person's not gonna have dysphagia, right? They, you, when you go to the ER and you see them, they're actually eating a Big Mac at the time, like when you see them, right? So like just you can use common sense and say like they don't have any symptoms in their face, you know, they have no nothing, they're, they're actually eating while I saw them, yeah, okay, that person just doesn't have any dysphagia, and that's okay. You just document that, that's fine. The other way you could do it is the bedside nursing dysphagia screen, which is a simple and quick thing, and that's a perfectly valid form of uh, assessing the patient. And then you don't have to make them MPO. I get like irritated about the MPO thing because every stroke patient, no matter what's wrong with them, gets made MPO on admission, and then by the time I go see them, they're yelling at me because they're hungry. And you were the ones that made them MPO. <laughs> so this happens all the time. So not every patient needs to be MPO. Like if they're asymptomatic or something, it's okay to let them eat, it really is. Then they won't yell at me. Um, and I'm gonna throw you under the bus. I will tell them, you know, you didn't get breakfast because it's Matt Hartledge's fault. So, um, but yeah, just the bedside, you know, and if you're worried about it, just order a bedside nursing dysphagia screen. It's really, it's that simple. So, and then if the patient like has, you know, if their face is all droopy and they can't talk and they obviously have a deficit, that's the patient where they definitely should be seen by speech first before you really, you know, do anything. But that's, you know, that's really a minority of the patients. A lot of these patients can eat, it's not a problem. You just have to document something. Doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be like a book. Um, DVT prophylaxis is another core measure, again, but this, there's nothing really special about stroke. It's the same as your DVT prophylaxis for all of the rest of your patients, so that's, that one's simple. Um, depression screening is a new recommendation. The guidelines don't really say how to do it. They just say that you should do it, but it's not really a core measure yet. Um, so. It might become one, but I, it doesn't, as best I can tell, it's not really gonna be considered a core measure yet. That could change like tomorrow, but as of right this minute. Uh, rehab assessment, this is another one that, that people don't really understand. So this is another one of these core measures. So again, this can be accomplished by any of the following. So the, the attending physician can say, Rehab needs to be assessed and no needs identified, right? So like let's say a patient gets admitted for what you're gonna call a TIA, right? So by definition, they're asymptomatic. So that if you're asymptomatic, you don't have any rehab needs. So you don't need to be, you know, you don't have to hold that person in the hospital an extra day so that PT can see them. You can just say they don't have any rehab needs. That's okay. You just have to document that. And that's perfectly acceptable. I do this all the time in, in there. And you don't have to be a neurologist to do it. Again, it's just like common sense, right? If they can't walk, then yeah, you know, they need a, you know, an evaluation and they probably need to go to rehab. But for the easy ones, just say they don't need anything. Um, it's that simple. So seizure prophylaxis, yeah, again, just like every other guideline on seizure prophylaxis, Grumpy Cat says no, just don't, you know, you don't need to do it. 
Um, cerebral edema, this is, so this is one of the more interesting complications that, you know, you deal, we deal with this with the big strokes a lot. Um, so the things that we do to treat this, um, some of them get kind of exciting, but, you know, at least, at least keep their serum sodium normal. Hyponatremia is going to make their edema worse. Um, hyperglycemia is also going to make their edema worse, so just try and keep them reasonably close to normal. Um, and that's fine for the minor cases. For the worst cases, we're going to treat them with some form of osmotherapy, which is going to be hypertonic saline primarily and or mannitol. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of reasons why that's the way we do it, and I'm not going to bore you with those details. but. That's the way we normally do it. In the most extreme cases, you know, we're going to do a decompressive craniectomy where we actually, the neurosurgeon will take off um, half of the skull. Um, lots of these people will also get ventriculostomies also. But just one thing to understand about this is that it's not, you know, most of these people, you're not really treating hydrocephalus and you're not really going to fix the problem with the ventriculostomy, at least. You might help it a little bit, but it's not really the fix. So it is different than, like, obstructive hydrocephalus. Um, this is what somebody looks like after, you know, you do a decompression. You can see, you know, half of their skull is, is missing there. They've got extracranial herniation there. Their brain's sort of hanging out. Um, it works really well, and it's not really as scary as it sounds. And, you know, some people actually, you know, can, can recover pretty well. So um, particularly young people, so like the, the sort of the prototypical person you're gonna do this to is like the 30-year-old kid that has a carotid dissection, has a really big stroke, and if you don't do this, you know, by day three or four, they're herniating, dying. But, you know, you can do these, you know, big craniectomies, and they, you know, they can look really bad for a long time, but, you know, they can, they can actually make good recoveries at that young age. Like, you know, you can have people where, like, they take out their whole MCA territory, and six months later, they're, like, walking, and, you know, they can, even if it's on the left side, they're, like, kind of talking, they're walking, you know, they, they've sort of gone back to school. Like, they, people that age actually could do way better than you, you think they can. They have just so much more plasticity than old people. And that's why, you know, when they do these trials, there's always this kind of age limit that's involved with that. So. You know, these people, you can be somewhat more optimistic than, than, than older people. So, you, you know, it's dramatic, it looks kind of scary, but it ends up not really being that big a deal. Questions? Full steam ahead. All right. Uh, risk factor treatment, just going to go through this quickly. We talked about the permissive hypertension part, uh, and then begin titration to JNC guidelines, right? So people will ask me, oh, well, how do I treat the, what, do, what med do I put them on? Well, people like. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, uh, so, you know, some really smart people have like spent a bunch of time working all this stuff out and like reading a thousand journal articles and they came up with these guidelines. So I think we should probably just try them out and use them. So that's really probably always going to be my answer is just whatever the JNC guidelines say. Pretty straightforward. This is just an example of one of these trials that shows that, you know, and there's a lot of focus on using like ACE and inverse ARBs and stroke prevention. And again, you know, you get, and, and really actually the reason why I put this in here is that like this was like the Ramapril trial and you see they get a relative risk reduction of 32% of stroke, right? Now, there's another drug that is associated with about a 32% relative risk reduction and that's Agronox and that this is marketed very heavily and they throw this number out there all the time. But Ramapril, is basically free, and Agronox is like several hundred dollars a month. So both of these drugs get you the same relative risk reduction. So which one should we be using? Ramapril also tends to have less side effects. So um, one, about antiplatelet therapy is early, you know, antiplatelet therapy has been shown to significantly risk reduce risk, that's why starting an antiplatelet drug, you know, is, is, part, of the, is part of the guidelines. Um, 
just another one of these statin things. The, the statin thing has really kind of been beaten to death. I won't bore you with all those details. One thing that comes up around stroke is that, oh, you know, what about the bleeding risk from statins? Well, so there's been like, I don't know, like, you know, a metric tons worth of statin trials that have been done, right? Like thousands. And out of that thousand, there was like this one single trial, I think it was the Sparkle trial, that showed an increased risk of hemorrhage associated with statin use. And for some reason, everybody glommed onto that, and ever after, they're just focused on that, right? And it's like, it's just one trial. What about, what about the other 9,000 trials that showed no evidence of it? And how about the 40 meta-analysis? So finally, I think people have gotten past that, and we don't really worry about that anymore. Um, the other thing is the rhabdomyolysis comes up as an excuse all the time. The five-year risk of rhabdo on statins, 0.01%. So not a big deal. All right, last and final part, most important thing for the hospitalist. So this is your discharge checklist. Um, one thing I'll point out is that there's this column here for ischemic stroke, and notice that there's a little bit of a difference here. So we're still stuck in like the 1800s where we call intracranial hemorrhage a stroke and ischemic stroke a stroke. And we, we still haven't figured out that they're different disease processes. So, so they get all lumped in and everybody gets confused. But, you know, so there are some differences. So obviously, you know, patient with a hemorrhage, they don't have to go home on an antithrombotic drug, right? Uh, they, don't, they don't get TPA, so all this stuff. They also, they don't need a statin. So that, that's the one that comes up all the time. Statins don't change your risk for hemorrhage. They're not indicated. Um, they do need the dysphagia screen. They do need stroke education and the other stuff. But, um, you know, so the, just to point out those, those differences. And then I'll, as I go through this, I'm just going to give you a couple little details that will make, hopefully make your life easier. Uh, so the first core measure is, uh, is uh, DVT prophylaxis. Again, this isn't really any different than your other DVT prophylaxis stuff. It's just the same, so you got to do it. Okay, so this one is a source of a little confusion. So this core measure, what it says is the discharged on antithrombotic therapy. And note what they say here, discharge on antithrombotic therapy. It does not mean that every single person has to get aspirin. So, and they only have to be on one. So if, like, let's say they're on Plavix and you're just gonna keep them on Plavix, that's fine. You don't have to also put them on aspirin. Or let's say you figure out that they have AFib and you're gonna put them on Eliquis or whatever, then that counts. That's an antithrombotic thing. You don't also have to put them on aspirin. So this, it, it's antithrombotic therapy, not aspirin. So, um, and, if, the, if you can't do it, just document why you can't do it. That's all. Not a big deal. Uh, people that get AFib, they should either be anticoagulated or just say why you're not going to do it. Like, you know, they were here three weeks ago for their third subdural hematoma. Okay, that's reasonable. Just, just say that. Um, fourth one, um, thrombolytic endovascular therapy. This one, that, this one's really my job, so you don't, you know, you, hopefully you should never have to worry about this being documented. But just so you know, is that that's something that needs to get commented on, is that they, you know, they need to get, you know, this kind of therapy, or you document what the contraindication is. Um, you know, that's my job. If I ever forget to do it, tell me and I'll, I'll, I'll do it. But that's, it's part of my note template, so usually that's not going to be a problem. Um, this is just a variation on the antithrombotic th uh, therapy, um, is that it needs to be uh, started by the end of day two, um, and again, it's just one type. Um, if, if the patient has, you know, got TPA, um, then you're not going to start it until 24 hours after they get TPA. If for some reason you're not going to do it, like let's say they had some bleeding or something, that's fine. Just document why you didn't do it. Not a problem. Discharged on statin medication. Again, I, I think we should probably just use this LDL greater than 70 because I think that's where it's going to go. Um, and then you should start them on high intensity statin therapy. If they can't tolerate it, you know, do moderate. If they can't, if there's some other reason why you're not going to do it, it's fine. Just document it. Why not? You know, um, one thing they say in the guidelines, but they 
don't really say in the core measure description is that the, this applies to patients 70 years or younger, um, but the core measure thing doesn't really give you this exemption for over 70, which they really should, because if you're 95 years old and you've made it that far without a statin, like, is that really gonna help you? I mean, you're probably still gonna live longer than me without it, so it's fine. But so, you know, just say the patient's 95, they're old, they're crotchety, they don't wanna take their statin, done, okay, not a problem. Dysphagia screen, uh, we talked about this too. Again, this is uh, just, it can be done a variety of ways, it's just something has to be documented. And that's um, before taking any PO, so you can't like do the dysphagia screen like 24 hours after they admitted when they've been taking PO meds and have had three meals, like that's a follow up. You gotta do it before. Stroke education, again, this, uh, there's some caveats here, it has to, include patient-specific risk factors. I think we've been doing pretty good on this. We have this process pretty well worked out, provided that they're not on like five south or something where they're not maybe as familiar with this. But if they're on the regular neural floor, people are generally, they kind of know the drill. Um, because you kind of, there's some bullet points you gotta kind of hit. It's not quite as simple as just hand them the stroke book and run away. So, you know, but we have this thing, the nurses do a good job of teaching them the stuff. If you do it, uh, if you do some stuff, it's also helpful if you document it. Like you said, take your insulin and you know stop smoking, and this is you know constitutes addressing their specific risk factors. And then assess for rehab. That's um, what we talked about before. You can just document they don't. You assess them, and they don't need anything. You know that's that's fine. You don't have to hold them for PT necessarily. And that's it. That's all I got. <coughs> Any, any questions?